You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. This is the Center Steer Podcast, the first Land Rover podcast on the planet. Center Steer is a podcast by, for, and about Land Rover owners. Welcome to show number 63 for June 2018. If you're a very first-time listener to the show, and I suspect there may be some because of our guest this month, we're only talking about Land Rovers. Nothing else. There's no politics in the show. We're just talking about Land Rovers. If you don't like talking about Land Rovers... I have no problem if you turn off the show and uh, move on with your life. That's completely fine. And if you haven't found us before now, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I'm your host, John Costage, from the studio outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Joining me via Skype is uh, my buddy Harold, from also from Pennsylvania. Yep. <laughs> and also my friend, my new friend. I'll call you, I'm calling you my new friend now, Mike. That's okay. Oh, good. That's cool. From South Carolina. You represent JustBritish.com? I do indeed. All things British of all sorts. And, you and have the a- numbers. You have a you have a newsletter that folks can uh, can get part of. To yeah, a all- website at justbritish dot com to check out, and a basically weekly newsletter that comes out with all the news that's fit to print and a few things that's not. And our uh, other friend of the show, uh, Morgan, is who is in Vermont and represents seriesparts dot com, which is a site you can visit for all your uh, if you're looking for uh, Land Rover series or Defender parts. Uh, he's camping this weekend and not available to join us. Our guest this month is Malcolm Nance. He's a 30-year Navy veteran, U.S. Navy veteran. He's a Middle East intelligence expert and commentator. He's not here, as I said, to talk about politics, but about his extensive Land Rover collection. He's been behind the wheel of some interesting and unique Land Rovers, some for work, some for pleasure. All of which did important things at some time or another. Special thanks to our monthly Patreon subscribers. Your support really does help, especially with domain management and website hosting. Uh, if you visit patreon.com slash center steer in the British spelling for all the details. Also, thanks for everybody's comments, likes, follows on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and emails. I got one from uh, Dixon from OVLR, and I need to we'll hopefully have him on the show soon, and we can talk about the, uh, the OVO, OVLR club out of uh, Ottawa, Canada. To celebrate the 70th anniversary of Land Rover, the Center Steer podcast is holding a giveaway. We want you to post a video or a video or a picture of you toasting the Wilkes brothers on Instagram. Uh, sit, st- sit or stand next to your Land Rover and, you know, say thanks, Maurice and Spencer. Happy anniversary, Land Rover. Words of your choosing is fine. Uh, English language is not necessary. In fact, other languages are kind of cool because it fits with the Land Rover worldwide appeal. You don't have a Land Rover? Borrow a friend's, take a picture of Malcolm Nance's and put yourself in front of it. Uh, find, find a find a toy model. model. Uh, be sure. Or, or find some sand and a stick. Well, that's a good idea, too. Or maybe some rust. Uh, hey, no. <laughs> be sure. The important part here, be sure to hashtag your Instagram post with hashtag WilkesToastLR70 and tag at Center Steer and Alloy and Grit. Alloy and Grit uh, magazine is uh, helping us out uh, with the giveaway. And you, you can the giveaway runs uh, through September 7th, 2018 with three winners who will be randomly selected from all properly tagged posts. Two winners will receive a one-year subscription to the Alloy and Grit magazine. One winner will receive SNX 891 mug and stickers. And we'll contact the winners through Instagram. You're going to need to, we're going to need your email and postal address to receive any winnings. And if you win the mug and SNX stuff uh, outside the U.S., hopefully you'll uh, work with us a bit on shipping because it can be expensive. So thanks to Alloy and Grit for joining us for that giveaway. We've had an entry or two so far, and I know one person asked about, uh, does it have to be on, on Instagram? Yeah, this is makes life easier. If you really want to, you know, we need to have it in some social place. That's the whole point of this, to draw attention to the podcast. So, um, you know, if you put on Facebook and you hashtag it, just let me know. How's that? And if there's enough entries, there might even be another little special prize coming. Ooh. Is that from you? Maybe. Maybe. Is that, is that from you? Maybe. Okay. Mm. Let's get into the news then. 
Jaguar Land Rover U.S. May 2018 sale sales results, thanks to DressBritish.com for providing these numbers. Uh, <laughs> uh, they reported in May U.S. sales. They reached a new May high sales of 7,103 units. That's a 42% increase from May of 2017. Uh, Jaguar sales were up. Uh, no, they weren't. I apologize. They were down 24% from May of 2017. They sold 2,366 units versus 3,100 units. JLR sales, both brands, are up 17% from the previous year, uh, previous May in 2017. For the full year of 2017, JLR sales reached 114,333 units, which is a 9 up 9% compared to uh, 105,000 in 2016. So things are... Is that on pace? I wonder if we should have the uh, author of this article. Did they do any crunch, any numbers? Maybe he is, uh, uh, is JLR on pace for a good 2018 or not? Uh, if you're referring to me... <laughs> um, <laughs> I am, Our actually. statistician in chief. The statistician who believes their numbers... They believe, from everything that's been said in other places, they believe their numbers are going to fall. Yeah. Um, which is the source of the upcoming layoffs and some other restructuring. Um, so they're on pace at the moment, but they supposedly keep waiting for the diesel slash Brexit other shoe to fall and sales to go down. And or, not to get political again, Import tariffs to the U.S., which could yep. really cut things. Absolutely. Yeah, I because know. rusty old trucks are such a threat to national security. Yes, but, uh, the, well, but the nice just, shiny new ones and all yeah. the parts that go along with them, yeah. So if you put an across-the-board 25% tariff on those, oh, it's yeah. a slight impact on business. Yeah, it's not just Well, the yeah, absolutely, the on the new stuff and, and the old stuff. And for those of us who make our livings working on the old stuff, getting parts is, is going to be impacted, definitely. Right. Because, you know, and then I heard I have somebody was like, well, you know, most of my parts are – the, the cheaper Chinese ones. Anyway, I'm like, well, Chinese parts come from out of the country too. So, yeah. you know, it doesn't and exactly... sadly, a, a lot of North American manufactured vehicles use a lot of Chinese content. So even yeah. your supposed domestic vehicles that this legislation is supposed to help is going to hurt. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's, it's going to be a sticky wicket. Oh yeah, Glo Absolutely. Globally, uh, JLR sales increased 6.1% in May. Uh, they reported that they sold 48,281 units in May, driven by introduction of new models, including the Velar. Uh, Jaguar uh, brand of vehicles in May were at 14,507 units. That's an increase of 6% over May of 2017. So Jaguar globally did much better than they did here in the U.S., so there's some global numbers for you that is not supplied by JustBritish.com, Mr. Yulon. Well, be that way. <laughs> well, it's 2018, and 10 years ago, I guess we're celebrating in a way, JLR, oddly enough, celebrating in a way, uh, JLR was sold to Tata. So it has been 10 years when Ford, you know, the financial crisis hit, the recession hit, and they ended up selling JLR after having acquired both of those companies. So this article is from Automotive News. In fact, we have two of them here to kind of re reference. Like nearly all automotive success stories, JLR's resurgence is rooted in engineering and design. Ford Motor Company also deserves some credit. Even though the auto giant wasn't able to finish its plans for the luxury brands before more pressing problems forced a sale during the recession. Uh, current and former JLR executives agree Ford did, not, did considerable work to set up JLR for success. One example, in the 90s, Ford began developing a production system for lightweight aluminum bodies. In 1993, Ford built 40, 40, wow, Ford built 40 Mercury Sable sedans with riveted and bonded aluminum panels, saving 400 pounds over the steel version. Though the production method was too expensive for Ford's high-volume mainstream vehicles, it was a perfect fit for Jaguar. A decade later, Range Rover moved to an aluminum body using a modified version of the production system Ford developed. Ironically, Ford did use its system for the aluminum body 2015 F-150. Two more pieces of JLR's puzzle were E.M. Cullum, Jaguar's head of design, and Jerry McGovern, Land Rover's design boss. Both possessed a lifetime of passion for the brands and were now free to express it in metal. Other article, which I have reached my limit and need to switch to the other browser. 
uh, yeah, uh, uh, automotive news. You know, you apparently if you you read it too many times, I think like three in a month, then and they you get dinged and have to. Uh, find well, you ways. figure at that point you really do want to be interested in their magazine, so they press you to give them some money and subscribe. A lot of times, if you turn the privacy non-tracking mode on, it won't do that. Uh, I opened up a private version of the browser. Wow, it worked. So this is a companion article: Jaguar Land Rover thriving under Tata so far. And just to kind of skip ahead to some really interesting numbers, on which I thought were interesting. The 2008 deal has been a win for Tata, for JLR, and even for Ford. So under Tata's ownership, JLR has increased global sales 146% from 252,000 vehicles in 2018 to 621,000 in last year. Posted eight consecutive years of profits, totaling 100, excuse me, 11.4 billion pounds, which is... Uh, almost $16 billion in profit. Rebuilt, integrated, and expanded the Jaguar and Land Rover lineups using flexible shared platforms and new powertrains and proprietary technologies. The Range Rover line is now Britain's largest luxury export, accounting for nearly 85% of all luxury vehicles built in the UK in 2016. Purchased billions of dollars of engines and body stampings from Ford, this has helped keep Ford's European factories running closer to capacity and gave Ford an avenue to recoup some billions it had invested in both brands over the years. Despite its own gasoline and diesel engines in-house, oh, excuse me, not despite, designed its own gasoline and diesel engines in-house and opened a plant to make them in uh, Wolverhampton, England, began manufacturing vehicles and engines overseas with plants in Brazil, China, and Slovakia. I did not know that Ford kept helping them uh, after the sale, at least to the extensively with the body stamping. Uh, yeah, somewhat with that. That uh, I was aware of that, but yeah, the engines uh, also, like the TDV6, uh, that's a Ford engine. Okay. Yeah, there was a transition plan basically that they would help them, since so much of the production was so tied to Ford. And that was as new models came out, the separations would be sort of on those new newer models. Right. Well, it's in, this goes to things we've talked about in the past. Uh, we've I mentioned it over the years that you know, JLR was uh, was really you know two separate companies as you as we know, uh, and and sometimes together, but sometimes not. But they never worked together, and it wasn't really until Ford had them both in house that they started getting them to work together. And I think that was really the the real win. And this has. Uh, reinforced that, supported that notion of them working together and uh, also having money and investment. Well, Tata gave them the investment to continue the work together and also creating new models that were updated, that were modern. <laughs> so, yeah, that, this... Uh, right, but I think the biggest thing Ford did for Land Rover was to, to like you say, partner them with, or uh, partner them with JAG, which Ford had already just spent the money and the time turning into a world-class company again. Right, Ford had put so much effort into the quality aspect and that whole mass producing at a high quality Right. That, that, that Jaguar needed to become what they are. And then by joining to, to Land Rover and putting that together, yeah. Right. And, and of course, the economies of scale of, of sharing the platforms and sharing the power plants and that sort of thing. And, and, and Jag was doing some great things with engines at the time that Rover was looking for something to do with the venerable Rover V8. And, right. and so that was a good marriage in that regard. Yeah. I guess so. Auto Week, which is this the consumer version of Auto Week, Harold? Is this the other companion piece? Uh, well, well, Auto Week is a sister publication to Automotive News. Automotive okay. News caters to the trades, and Auto Week is more of a consumer publication. So, Auto Week had a. I, I'm going to. This is a long one to read because there's some really interesting uh, information in here. So, if you want to say something, feel free to interrupt me. But there's a number of paragraphs here to read that uh, kind of summarizes many of the things that we've discussed over the years and gives some good insight also. In the wake of the 2018 financial crisis, the futures of the two companies, fresh from being cast off by Ford's premier automotive group, looked pretty dire. Jaguar seemed unable to escape uh, segments in which it was t uh, typecast for decades, sedans and coupes, and Land Rover was uh, stuck with aging platforms. Between the two companies, the best that they had were the Range Rover and the Jaguar XK, neither true volume cars. Jaguar's Ford-enabled expedition down market had faltered badly, and Land Rover was still smarting from the damage done by the notoriously unreliable Freelander. <clears throat> Sorry, that's a <laughs> personal, yes. 
<laughs> hurts, don't it? It does. It does. I still like that car, though. Uh, both both had the, the emphasis on car. It's no truck. Uh, well, yeah. Well, uh, but it also goes to the point about about uh, having to expand uh, expand its uh, its space. Both had very little idea of where they wanted to go. Jaguar was tired of getting uh, Jaguar was getting tired of churning out a new XJ every decade to be beaten by the Germans and the Japanese. Land Rover was still struggling to update its model range quickly enough, relegated to facelifting the aging Discovery. Fast forward to 2018, and things couldn't be different. Jaguar has a lineup of buyers uh, want to, cars buyers want, including crossovers, and planning its debut of the first ever electric SUV. Land Rover uh, was has struck gold with its Range Rover subbrand, which has been minting money in multiple currencies and in multiple segments. That is true, but it has been a decade of unprecedented. But has the decade of unprecedented growth reached a plateau? And so uh, Britain's Autocar points out that Jaguar Land Rover has seen a not insignificant fall in sales over the past six months, which we've referenced here on the show a number of times. In March alone, sales were down 7% year over year after a 3.8% decline between January and March. In the UK, as Autocar notes, sales were down 21% in the first quarter of 2018 and down 26% in March alone. The company bet heavily on diesel starting in the fall of 2015. I am skipping a couple things here just to, for lack of t- for time. So they, uh, yeah, they, the uh, company uh, bet heavily on diesel in starting in 2015. Jaguar's efforts to electrify the lineup should be received well in China, where new energy vehicles will continue to see growth. Also, neither brand is currently saddled with s- suddenly unpopular sedans, unlike some of their competitors. Jaguar plans for the ne- Jaguar's plans for the next XJ to be electric, and a and not a sedan at all. Is that right? Jaguar plans for the next XJ to be electric and not a sedan at all. Does that mean it's the XJ is going to be an SUV crossover? Huh. Kind of sounds that That's way. What it sounds it? like yep. I, I think they're planning on it being an electric crossover. Okay. For every, everything I've, every indication I've seen in some of the stuff that Ian Callum has said, uh, it would be, you know, a, a uh, mild crossover and electric. <laughs> no, a mild crossover. There's, I'm sorry, there's no such thing. You either are or you aren't. But I, I, I <laughs> well, get yeah, you either are or you aren't. And, and I mean, that's if they feel that the direction they have to go is crossover, that's fine. But at that point, I think they could like retire the XJ name because the XJ just needs to be a sedan. Right. Yep. Pick a new name. That's fine. Well, that's right. kind of like Ford, you know, getting rid of cars. It's like, and that that I mean, I understand that's a yeah. business decision. I'm just saying, don't. Don't name your new crossover non-car product after a venerated and traditional car. car. Yeah, yeah. Although to be to be clear, Ford is only getting rid of cars, most cars in North America. It's not a it's not a global thing. Right. Again, it's just it's a business decision based yes. on sales, and it makes sense. But they're not going around building trucks and calling them them the Focus. I, I will or, say or the though, Fiesta you know, or whatever. Yeah. I do dislike the I pace and was it F pace names. I, I I don't like those for some reason. But that's I'm not a Jaguar guy. I mean, I can sort of get it because the tradition is to to come up with a letter and then you know it's the the D type and the E type and the X type and I mean I like that tradition but and so for, the, pay, for the pace cars, is I a, like that. Yeah, for sports cars I like that tradition. Right. Um, but yeah, when you go to the just it's a car, it's a what's well, crossover. It's like yeah. Well, at that point, it shouldn't be a, a, a letter hyphen pace. It should be right. a letter hyphen space. <laughs> yeah. To finish Cause this. Because it, it ain't pace and it ain't grace. Or it should just be a Mark 25. I don't know. Yeah, okay. To finish this article up, a new Defender is also on the horizon, an event which will take place in a very favorable climate for pricey SUVs. And Land Rover has a lot of credibility in this segment. Just wanted to finish that up. So there you okay. go. So it's been ten years since the purchase, sale of, and and officially putting together of JLR uh, into kind of one cohesive unit. So, which I think is probably the best single thing that Ford did for either company was to combine them like that. But you know, the reality is he saved both the uh, Ford's uh, the Ford company saved both uh, Land Rover and Jaguar from possible demise and, mm-hmm. and turned turned them around, got them headed in the right direction. And then in a way, their work was kind of done so they could pass them along to somebody else who could, could pick up the, 
the stick and keep going. And I think if had Ford actually continued to own them, I think we would have seen the brand move away from uh, not being heavy on the luxury side of it. I think it would have gone a little more down market than I think it probably would have. And I think it probably, you know, wouldn't have done well in that direction. And I think it would have hurt Ford, too, because, I mean, if Ford kind of needed to, to sell off some in some uh, some holdings in order to survive the, the economic downturn that we had in this country. And and Ford was able to do that successfully in a way that was good for good for Land Rover, good for for Jag, and and perhaps good for Volvo as well when they unloaded Volvo. But it was good for Ford because it freed up cash, reduced expenses, and Ford was able to survive the economic downturn with without any additional outside uh, help from the government or having to right. Uh, and they were and they were trying to build cars in one area that competed with their stuff in the other area. They weren't doing right. that game of, of competing against their, themselves. Right. So it was a good move for Ford, definitely. Yeah. And, and, but it was good for, for well, it was good for everybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I actually end up, and at least I, yeah, time has shown that 10 years later does seem to be definitely be good for everybody. So we're not, Having a vintage podcast, we actually have a podcast well, right. talking about and, more and I was vintage. apprehensive when it happened because I kind of liked what Ford was doing for the companies, but but then I was apprehensive because Tata was an unknown. I wasn't sure where they were going to go with the company, but right. thankfully they've done seemingly done all the right things. Yep. Moving on in the news, getting away from a specific Land Rover thing, Hamburg, Germany bans diesel vehicles starting next week, although this article came out at the end of May, so this was actually the beginning of June. Germany's second largest city, Hamburg, will ban the most polluting diesel cars from two major streets starting next week. Again, this would have been early June. In a move that could encourage other cities to follow suit, Hamburg, uh, home to around 1.8 million people, said on uh, Wednesday the ban would start on May 31 and affect diesel models that do not meet the latest Euro 6 emission, st emission standards. We add this to the list of bannings of internal combustion engines. Uh, I know it's not gasoline, but it's diesel here. But uh, that brings us to, you know, Britain is lo still looking to ban diesel and gas cars in 2040. France is looking at the same time span. India wants to go all electric uh, by 2030. The German government in general had voted to ban internal combustion engines by 2030. Norway wants a complete ban on petrol cars by 2025. China looks to ban uh, petrol and diesel cars. I don't think a decision had been made, though. Well, wasn't England looking at doing a similar thing and banning older diesels from their high congestion zone around London? I think there was some discussion, but I don't think anything had actually, had taken place. I believe you're right. Yeah, there. they were they were talking about it, but then you know it's that that thing that you figure out. Oh, wait a second, those are all the trucks that bring all the supplies into London. Um, right. So, yeah. So that, so it got bogged down. Okay. Because uh, all of a sudden, wait a second, that's going to hurt business. Wait a second. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah especially when you you're relying on on all that stuff to come in to keep the city going. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, then that goes to, you probably have, uh, there's different companies, not just Tesla, but working on big rigs and trucks too. You know, Mercedes is working on it. So I suspect when those things come closer to fruition, then I think that be easier for that band. Yeah, it'll rear its head again, yeah. Yeah, of course, when you can ship your supplies by, by rail with an electric locomotive, that's another option. Yeah. Right. Land Rover is developing an off-road autonomous driving system. Now, when I saw this headline, <laughs> I was like, really? What's the point? But when you read it and you get the details, I, it makes sense. And I'll, I'll just read some of the things here uh, I highlighted from the article. Land Rover wants to take self-driving cars off-road. Today's cars uh, equipped with semi-autonomous technology rely on paved roads with clear line markings and orderly traffic patterns to orient themselves. And even in those conditions, they don't always work perfectly. Land Rover hopes to develop self-driving cars that can not only find their way through places without roads, but that can navigate through vision-obscuring conditions like dirt, rain, or snow. The automaker is developing what it calls a 5D sensor array that combines acoustic sensors, cameras, LiDAR, and radar to give a car greater awareness of their environment. Companies won't always be able to count on clear lane markings and signage or good weather, so cars would have to be equipped to deal with... So cars need to be equipped to deal with less than optimal conditions. This may be... 
a major long-term benefit of Cortex. Cortex is the name of the project, by the way. So that, and that okay. when I when I read that, that it's like, oh yeah, it makes sense because I've always wondered this about all. As one of my questions when I heard anything about autonomous cars, because as you guys know, Pittsburgh is kind of a center for autonomous driving, with Uber having an operation here. It's like, well, you only hear about them when they're on the streets during nice weather, you know, sunny weather. What happens when it's we know the weather's bad or snow or rain or ice? So, you know, Land Rover doing this makes a lot of sense now. To have- right. When it can't see the lane dividers uh, it, because there's too much snow, what do they do? Right. Exactly. Or a point that's not made in this article, but I've made before is, so if, if you have more autonomous cars on the road and then people will start to use them, they're going to lose their driving skills. And yeah, so when yeah, the weather, or, or what they still have of them. Oh, I was about to say right, that assumes what, that they have still have those driving skills. Man, but, when, but, when yeah. the, but when the weather, hard to lose but, what you don't have. Uh, yeah, so, I, yeah. So when the weather turns bad and you expect the human to take over, they're not going to have those skills because they, if they can't do it normally and react well, they're going to get even more tense driving in snow or ice or bad weather. Yeah. So it makes makes some sense to me that the you know while it sounds bad, like oh you're going to take away off road driving for me, I re, you know I, I want to challenge myself. I think I'll still be there, and we still have our heritage vehicles. But I think in, in the long term, this makes a lot of sense. And, and the one thing I can I can think about it, where it might be beneficial is every now and then when you're off road, you get into a situation that's just looking really sketchy and you're getting kind of nervous, like maybe you're going to roll over and get hurt. This would be an opportunity for you to get out of the vehicle. So if it does go over, at least you're not involved in it. You could stand back and let your truck negotiate the obstacle without you being in danger, and then you can get back in and continue. Yeah, that would be an excellent thing. Or when you look about things such as uh, hurricane recovery, sending out you know disaster oh, yeah. vehicles, right? Uh, and hurricanes or any other natural disaster, or hazardous. And even conditions. have applications. You know, you, in, a, in a weird way, when you're talking like Mars rovers and whatever, they're they're off road vehicles. And it's got a lot well, of. Applications. It doesn't get more off road than the surface of Mars. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The surface of another planet. So there's got a lot of applications. I, I yes, exactly. That's a good good way to put that. Yeah, it's incumbent upon upon people to understand that it shouldn't replace learning how to do stuff. Well, at least in our generation, I think it's coming. It's just it's inevitable. Well, yeah, it's inevitable. I know. But yeah, I know what you mean. JLR preps for electric era by moving SUV from UK. So you may have heard that, uh, so I'll just read the details here. Britain's uh, biggest car maker, JLR, is moving all production of its Land Rover Discovery SUV to Slovakia from a plant near Birmingham, which will be retooled to accommodate a new generation of electric cars. Uh, the company will create a new factory platform at its Sully Hall, England plant that will enable the production of cars in electric, gasoline, and diesel versions, said people, similar to the matter. All discovery production will be gone from the UK by early 2019, resulting in possible job cuts at the Sully Hall plant before it ramps up staffing again. Uh, previously, I think they had said that some discovery production or maybe assembly would be moved there, but now they're saying everything will be moved. After its makeover, the plant will produce the new Range Rover and Range Rover Sport models. The manufacturer will build the next version of its Range Rover Evoque Sport utility vehicle at a site in uh, Hellwood in Northern England, where Discovery Sport is also made. It also has an agreement with Magnus Steyr to build the Jaguar E-Pace Compact and all-electric I-Pace models in Austria. The Slovakia plant will be open in late 2018. You know, the dark side of me thinks this is a, this is a maneuver to uh, shift by shifting all the discovery production out of England. Everything in England becomes the Range Rover company and, and uh, uh, gradually the Range Rover takes over. And pretty soon the company is not about Land Rovers anymore. It's all about Range Rovers. So it's all luxury all the time. Yeah. And, and maybe discovery gets sold to somebody else and it's no longer part of the company. And well, discoveries and, are and, pretty much a luxury now anyway. I understand that, but I mean, you know, the whole distinction yeah. of the Range Rover family versus the Discovery family, and there's a couple of Discoveries, and there's like five, well, six, seven Range Rover models now. It's becoming the Range Rover company. Well, that yeah, it, it almost is splitting into the Range Rover company and the Land Rover company. Well, I understand that, but by shifting yeah. all the Land Rover production out of the country, it becomes pretty right. easy for them to really separate and for the Land Rover stuff to even get sold off to somebody else. And it's yeah. strictly all Range Rover all the time now. 
Well, that's not completely the case here, though. The, the, you know, um, Disco, maybe not. Disco Sport is still going to be made alongside, uh, you know, and then we still don't. Yeah, but on the other, we can and, look at it more practically. It's a way to overcome uh, things being made in the EU. Yeah. You know, spread out that manufacturing base. Well, and, know, and as Jerry has said, you know, you, there's the third leg of the stool has not been revealed yet, or that third family. You still have the defender right. coming coming into line to see how that affects. Right? Yeah. Well, well, they keep saying it's coming, but yeah, we, you know, where is it? Show us. Some of us are actually losing hope. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's coming. I think it's it's going to be the end of the uh, towards the end of the year. They're going to. I suspect they'll announce it. It's splash. And in what country are they going to make it? Again, remains to be seen. See what happens. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But it'll probably be, uh, you know, uh, there'll be an electric variant. There'll be, you know, diesel variants. There'll be a petrol variant. So, uh, you know, well, we can hope that. Well, speaking of hope, it's actually a poor, poor transition. Uh, there was an article <laughs> that came out. <laughs> it never stopped us before. <laughs> that came out in GQ magazine out of the UK, the, D- the UK GQ, and they interviewed Jerry McGovern. Uh huh. So I thought, the Jerry quotient GQ. Uh, ooh, that was good. And uh, so I'll read some of this. Uh, it, it was very, it's a very short one. There's a couple questions, but the introduction was good. And I thought in a couple of the questions, which are relevant to us, it, this came out, you know, l- last month we did the whole deep dive into Jerry. This came out after we had that discussion. So uh, this is kind of a little bit of a follow up. Jerry McGovern is a law unto himself as design director and chief creative officer for Land Rover. He is a hard task master, prescriptive in his demands and unrelenting in his ambitions. Recognized as one of the leading automotive designers in the world, he tends to be one of the industry's most disruptive voices. And while he is a modernist at heart, he, in practice, he is a firebrand, in a good way, of course. Since rejoining Land Rover in 2004, after stints at Chrysler, Peugeot, Rover, and Ford, McGovern has completely reinvented the mark. I visited the Coventry HQ last year and was overwhelmed by the number of vehicles in development. Having said that, McGovern would have been disappointed if I hadn't been impressed. He is demanding as he is exact. And that was, of course, the author of this. So how did you first become interested in technology? And McGovern replies, for me, technology is just another tool. I'm interested in design enabling technology rather than tech for the sake of it, which I will say is good. I like that. that, that and that kind of fits in some of the things we've seen. So that was a, I'm, I'm all for anything that doesn't involve tech for the sake of tech. Yes, mm-hmm. I agree. I agree. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that, so that's a positive there. Use it when necessary, but otherwise... Yes. Knock it off, and also hi- and hide it when you can, or don't make it right. look obvious like it is tech. Uh, it was that skeuomorphism where you know something it, it may be just because it should uh, something looks a certain way because of tech, and then like the floppy disk, uh, the three and a half inch floppy disk is still in many times used as the save button, you know, in, in on the computer, but, right? You know. No one, we know what that is, but there's a generation of people that don't. Yeah, uh, most of the people using the button have no idea what the icon is supposed to be. Right. So do you really need a shift lever, for example? Maybe you don't because it's not necessary. You know, as a, well, for example. If you have a real transmission, you do. But you... <laughs> when's the last time you saw one of those? <laughs> so the next question is, you seem obsessed with modernism, with honing and refining. And Jerry replies, and I may add emphasis here. I apologize. I'm obsessed with reduction, with getting rid of the unnecessary. For me, modernism is just a term for not having excessiveness. I actually like that. I do agree with that. That yeah, makes, I agree. That makes some sense. And he, he talks about that uh, more in the article. You can see he talks more about that around the Velar. And the Velar is a ex- perfect example of what he's talking about there. It is just the car. There's nothing ex- excessive there, nothing extraordinary, nothing, or not, not extraordinary is not the word, nothing excessive. It's all you know minimized and brought down to its base uh, design. If you, if you look at you know, interior design for the last 50 years, especially like the mid-century modern movement, it was all about very simple, clean lines. And the final question I'll, we'll discuss here in this uh, has the word that we like to hear, so it's important to bring up. Question, how important is theater in automotive design? And this is his whole response. If you take reductionism to the optimum point, you can end up with something sterile. At the end of the day, you are designing an object that has to be relevant. With a Defender, there is a clear view that it has to celebrate its past. But so much has changed since it started. Lifestyle will influence the design and propel it from the original. The trick is to capture the essence of what the vehicle was, but not to be oversensitive to what's gone before. I like that. That actually makes some okay. sense to me. 
but now the question is, can he do it? Thank you. It's exactly it. Will will it? Yeah. Will it? And can he do it such that we'll like it? That it, that we yeah. that we see it. Uh, well, know. if you ask Jerry, of course, we're going to like it no matter what. Right. But the question is whether that's actually going to happen. That remains to be seen. Right. And you know, is what we've seen so far with the you know the Range Rover and the Discovery. Uh, I don't know. I'm not too. I'm not. Too, I'm less hopeful than maybe I had been in the past. Uh, I'm preparing to be somewhat underwhelmed. Uh, okay. Okay. Whether it'll. I mean, I don't know that. I mean, I'm hoping that it won't be a bad product, but I don't expect it to be phenomenally great either. Well, Twitter, I'm expecting to be either be underwhelmed or blown out of the water. It's going to be one extreme or the other. Okay, well that's great. Um, I just I don't plan for the I just latter think at all. You're looking to go. Oh, that's really great. That's good. Fantastic. You're either going to go. Oh my God! I never expected that. That is amazing. Or you're going to go. Eh. Well, and let's be clear, that's going to be on the design aspects of it. I think we pretty much know its capability is going to be a, a Disco 5. And pretty much the same, same uh, technology is going to be used. It makes sense. Right. It's been proven. It has to. I mean, it, it's, that's a foregone. That, that, that it has to use the same stuff. So, it, yeah, I'm sure it'll be capable. And it's, I'm sure, I know it'll be capable. But, yeah, whether it's going to look stupid or not is, is a whole other story. Right, because that technology has been proven. They've been using it for a number of years now, and then they can tell you that the new Defender okay. is capable. We know it because we have experience with it. We've been doing it for but a it while. it can't just be capable like a Discovery 5, or it doesn't serve a purpose. What does that, what do you mean? Because then it's a Discovery 5. Well, how's it's a Discovery 5 be, different a, than a I mean, the, Range Rover? The old Defender, the old Defender could do other things beyond... Just you know that that basic whatever. I mean, there's got to be something besides looking at it. Do you want it to be a tracker? Sets this that this sets this defender apart from the Discovery Five. There's got to well, be. Well, I don't think a, you're going to find PTOs as an option or, or Category Three hitches or, or anything no, like that. No, but, so. but there's got to be something that goes goes. Okay, this is why this thing has a reason to exist. Can I hold hold? Can I hold you there for a second, Michael? You're so I get what you're saying. So tell me what you think a defender did in the past that you would like it to maybe do now, or or maybe not necessarily do now, but you expect that it could. What's something interesting? Uh, I mean, and, and I'm not saying this carries through to the future, but even going back uh, to our discussions about Oxford, you could repair it in the field. It if you made, for lack of a better term a Lego-like Defender, so, oh, this thing broke. Let me swap in this entire new unit in the field. That would amaze me. That's, that, that's, yeah. that's Well, I would be impressed if that would be possible and still meet all the modern regulations. Yeah, well, I, I'm not even saying... That would be that's impressive. impressive. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm not even saying that's what it is, but something that would would make this thing revolutionary to itself and not just, oh, you built me a boxy Discovery 5. Thanks. Well, I, I hate to tell you this, but I think that's what you're going to get. Uh, you, yeah, you know, we, I think you're right. I think it's going to be just a different style of the same underpinning. Either that or huh? cut the price in half. Oh, that, I think that, yeah, the price will be cut, but it's, it's not going to be half. Discovery yeah. 5, and that would be revolutionary for current day Land Rover. Yeah, I don't think it'll be that... that it, that that would be expensive. nice too, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. No, because they've already moved up. First of all, they've already moved up up brand. You know, they're they're in that yeah. kind of luxury segment, so I don't and, think that'll and, happen. And it's honestly, just... I think that the Defender is going to slot price wise between the Discovery and the Range Rover. I think it's going to be your mid grade. Yeah, and that I I don't think which that. is wrong, but I think that's what it's going to do. And I don't think so. I think uh, it'll yeah, be under the I'm, Disco. Yeah, I'm basically. Well, I guess it, I mean you can hear it. That sounds horrible, especially with what I do. But um, I'm losing hope in the in the Defender. And they better fix it soon because I know a lot of other people who are too. Well, losing hope in the Defender is different than losing hope in all of Land Rover, right? Or are you equating the two as the same? Because you know, Land Rover is is more than just the, the Defender. Well, oh, very, very much so. But the Defender, I guess, in a way, and and I, and I haven't thought this through, so I'll I'll fall on my face while I say it. <laughs> the Defender was always in the one tens and all before it was always the the common man's Rover and Land Rover. And if they move firmly and totally, which McGovern I think is, has hinted these doing totally into that upscale, 
then they eventually do lose touch. They uh, lose that, touch that, 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 lot. And that points to my comment earlier about it becoming the Range Rover company. Right. And that that actually points to that. I'm going to disagree with the disagree with you guys, n- not just because uh, to, for cool podcast content, but because I actually do disagree with you. I do. It's I do think the Defender will be the entry level brand, although entry level price may not be what you would want it to be. I think it, the we'll use the same underpinnings as I believe. Let's see. It looks like you know Land Rover uses like maybe two or three different chassis all throughout the same the same thing uh, throughout the whole uh, mark, and they've they've been using them. It's already been proven. It's been used, and they will have a different you know uh, structure on that. In addition to that, it will then be it, since it will be less uh, less price uh, than. That will be the introductory model, and that can be the utilitarian one. I think the quality materials on the inside will not be at the upper le- upper end. So, so still... you're saying the defend the new defender will be the poor man's disco? Yes. Okay. And see, that would be wonderful. I think that's, that. I think that'll be okay. Yeah. Give It'd me an okay. interior like the Honda Element that you can wash out with a hose. Yeah, which I think was misnamed. They should have called. They missed the boat on that one. They should have called that the Honda Beatnik. <laughs> yeah, go to work. Well, that that was a case where they completely misunderstood the audience uh, of right, exactly. who's going to buy. Which is the same thing with the Scion, by the way. Is another, another note. Oh yeah. Anyways, we shall we move on. I think we do. Has everybody had their got their defender comments uh, made? Now we can grumble all day, but we don't need to. All right. Yeah, but we can't defend those comments. Whoa! <laughs> can we new? Oh. Can we new defend those comments? Uh, but we can discover some. Oh. New. All right, we're moving on in the range. Yeah, please, let's move on. I, I think Michael got it. Uh, he heard me. I got it. it. Okay, thank you. I'm pretending not to. It, I tried to evoke a response, but it didn't come. <laughs> hey, knock it off, dude. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. Good. We're going to talk about Jaguar then. 2019 Jaguar I Pace first drive review. The future is now. Jaguar beats the Germans in bringing a Tesla fighter to market. Just a couple of things about you can read all this whole article because all the detail about everything. I'll bring out a couple specs about it though because I think this is the future not only of uh, Jaguar but probably of Land Rover. All-wheel drive crossover can travel 240 miles on a single charge of its 90 kilowatt battery. Cost competitive of $69,500 before federal and state incentives. It can accelerate from 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds. It's about as quick as a Jaguar V8 F-Type sports car. And they go on. But a whole lot less fun. I don't know, actually. Depends on what you mean by fun. Although they do pipe in, I think, some sound into the cabin. Yeah, I need the noise. Yeah, you you got to have the sound. Plus, you know, it's great to accelerate at four point six, but you know, in the first corner, I think the sports car is going to be more fun than the crossover. Yeah, well, they'll get better at the technology too over time. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just a natural progression. So there you go. That's just the the future is coming, and I know we're mainly Land Rover, but it's good to talk about the sister mark at times because that's also influences the the Land Rover mark. The 2018. Well, and it's the future future of the platform too. So, indeed, if you think about it, power plant development is is seems to be driven by Jag. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the 2018 Land Rover Discovery diesel review, three rows and a 33 mile per gallon in an all terrain package. So, the drive here in the U.S. Uh, reviewed the uh, Disco Five. So, I'll read a couple of those comments. Uh, so, so, that's this is a U.S. review. Yes. So then the 33 miles per gallon is miles per U.S. gallon, not imperial gallon. Call it the best $2,000 you will ever spend at a Jaguar Land Rover dealership. The optional 3-liter turbo diesel V6 in the uh, Land Rover Discovery delivers mammoth mileage gains, and its torquey ways are, ideally, are ideally suited to a free a four-wheeling seven-passenger SUV. Simply maintaining a rough 60 to 65 miles per hour pace I saw a stellar 33 highway miles per gallon in the Discovery, beating the, its federal rating by more than 25%. Sounds about right. The, sp- the spectacular V6 turbo diesel delivers 254 horsepower and 443 pound-feet of torque. Uh, aptly served by an 8-speed automatic transmission, the 0-60 to 60 mark is broken in 7.7 seconds from a dead stop, keeping manageable pace with the 6.9 gasoline-powered Discovery. As far as telltale diesel noise, uh, there's just a mild chugga-chugga at idle, why I only really not- which I only really noticed while standing outside the running truck. And this is, of course, the 
uh, author of this uh, talking. Uh, mm -hmm. Yet this familiar, uh, the, yet this family scale Landy never uh, gets flummoxed. It steers smoothly, rides serenely, and feels as solid and quiet as its far pricier Range Rover cousin. It's a very satisfying SUV to drive. Some of my automotive colleagues insist on calling the Discovery ugly, but I strongly dispute this characterization. I mean, ugly compared to what? In terms of three-row three three row SUVs, a Mercedes uh, GL Class, a Honda Pilot. The interior is sharp, too, in a sturdy fashion I always admired in previous iterations of uh, the LR4. Compared with a Range Rover, it's posh without pretense, including materials that you wouldn't mind dirting up a little but only a little. And that kind of supports my point about the Defender maybe being underneath of this because it'll still be, you know, it'll be even less, uh, you, you'll worry less about it getting it dirty. And it goes, this goes on for a while if you want to read all the details about it, the the uh, cargo and the electronics and the technology and all that stuff in there. But uh, So they, they like the diesel. And it does better than they anticipated as far as uh, miles per gallon. Well, and only a, for only $2,000 uh, more, that's, that's really good bang for the buck. I mean, just in my in miles per gallon alone, it won't take you long to pay that off. Uh, yeah, it's well worth it. You know. Yeah. And when you consider the added added lifespan is you know over the life the co life cycle of the vehicle, it's going to cost you a whole lot less to spend the money now on the diesel. And you'll get better towing capacity, won't you, Harold? Depends. I mean, I mean, if you've got a gasoline engine with the same amount of torque, then theoretically, no. Uh, you know, it's about how much power your your power plant has for the most part. And, and so, I mean, I, it may or may not have more towing capacity. I don't know. But, but I mean, you can push the engine harder and it will last longer. And the other thing is that when you're towing and you've got that much load on the engine, your mileage falls off less with a diesel than it does with a gasoline engine. Go out and buy yourself a turbo diesel V6 Land Rover Discovery, and bring it over to southwestern Pennsylvania. We'll check it out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, that's uh, new vehicles reviews for this month. An old vehicle, though, converted to electric. A 1982 Range Rover in the U.K. was converted to electric, a 1982 original Range Rover. It has been souped up with 15 Tesla batteries to offer a total capacity of 80 kilowatts. Goal was to get a similar power to the original and get some and get somewhere between 150 and 200 mile range. And a recent test, they scored 175 miles of range with ordinary day-to-day -day driving. In absolute terms, it's lighter than a Tesla Model S. And there's a whole video you can watch. It's about 15 minutes, I believe. And we'll, of course, have a link to it in the show notes if you want to see what they did. And there you go. So there's, someone took a an old rangy and electrified it. The question is whether it's more or less likely to catch fire than a Tesla. And is it more or less likely to uh, for someone to uh, to fall asleep at the wheel or not pay attention at the wheel and hit somebody? Yeah, yeah there would be that too. As we move into fun things uh, about what people doing with their Land Rovers in Wales, the country kingdom, uh, someone has taken a Defender 110 and turned it into a pizza oven. Well, it has a pizza oven added to the back, and they call it. Wait for it. You want to? This is apparently our pun episode. It's the Land Dover, D O U G H V E R. Ooh. I want to know if the pizza oven is diesel fired. <laughs> I, I don't think so. They don't. They don't say that. The owner bought the Land Rover Defender from eBay after wanting to branch out within his catering company. Uh, he hired a vehicle refurb company to fit the one-ton oven into the Land Rover. But how does it drive? And the owner, Nick, says, it's very heavy, but it drives really well. It's the perfect vehicle to put an oven in. We can drive drives it. Real, drives really well for a kitchen appliance, apparently. We can drive it with the oven still on, too. It goes uh, it, it goes up about to, to 600, 600 degrees, the oven, that is. We have to remember not to get into petrol stations, though. So what is the zero to 600 time? <laughs> Again, all excellent questions that, that we can't answer for you on the podcast. But someone It is drives taking... with a little pep. Aroni. Oh, dear. Was that cheesy? Keep going. Keep going. Are you done yet? No, the crust isn't quite done. Now we need it followed by that other one from the previous show that had the, the um, beer kegs built into it. Uh, yes, people have taken uh, put beer kegs in them. There's a coffee shop in one of them. Yep. If There's... you had the beer one and the pizza one together. Yeah, you're all set. And then you get the coffee one, and then you've got the whole your whole day. I guess at some point you need the one with the restroom built into it, too, so... And some breaking news on the podcast, and I only say breaking because this happened yesterday. If you're a Game of Thrones fan, uh, Kit Harrington and Rose Leslie got married, and the reason that we're mentioning it is 
their wedding car, which is a kind of a British thing, it's not really an American thing, but their wedding car was a Defender 90, and it's a vintage one too. And if there's a, just, I found some really cool photos. You can go out and take a look at all of them. It's got that uh, 70s, 80s graphic on the side that they, the, in the, the the counties use that county graphic going on, and uh, it, the the paint is is it has a lot of patina to it. It's very dull. The front uh, bumper has some rust on it, like you know, across the whole thing. It's seen some time, and there's even a dent in the hood in the bonnet. So that thing has has seen some uh, some mileage. But it's a nice, it's a bl- nice powder, not not powder blue, but a nice blue Defender ninety. Okay, Michael, are you a Game of Thrones fan? I had to go look at the picture and figure out it's John Stark. Yeah, exactly. Right. Correct. Okay. Right. I, who is she, by the way? Do you know? I don't. I'm trying to think of who she was in the show. I, I, tried to, I didn't. I didn't. I I watch it, but I didn't care that much. Yeah, I really don't know who people are like that. Yeah, so, I, it's only Game of Thrones. I I don't care. Yeah, we're alienating listeners, but yeah, I mean, I we're I not, we're not watched it enough hey. to know. Oh, that's John Stark, and then that's about it. Well, I, I'm doing my job if I'm alienating listeners. So yeah, I watch Game of Thrones to see dragons eat people. That's it. So last month was the Land Rover Legend Show in Bister at Bister Heritage, and it was the inaugural Land Rover Legend show. It was a big hit, and so that now the, since since we talked about it the last time, was just uh, after the, uh, we recorded it after the show, but since then some show, some uh, articles have come out. There's two of them here. We'll t- at least we'll talk about them. One, first one here, it gives you a nice overview of the show, and uh, so, and the art, uh, author says, when you were tucked up in bed enduring the greatest nationwide lightning storm of our generation, which apparently took place in the UK, I guess, we hope you you spared a thought for those camping overnight during the latest two day event at Mister Heritage. Luckily, guests were unfazed, as being Land Rover enthusiasts, it would have taken more than some bad weather to deter their attendance at the inaugural Land Rover Legends event at Mister Heritage. The show was led by TV's Mark Evans, with guests including Tim Slesser of the Oxford Cambridge Expedition, Camel Trophy winners Joe and Bob Ives. Philip Bashel of the worshipped Dunsfold Land Rover Collection, and Chris Bishop, Managing Director of Restoration Firm, Bishop's 4x4. Uh, droves of aficionados crowded the demonstration hangar to get up close with genuine legends from the Land Rover stable. And they've got a bunch of photos here. You can take a look at yourself. Uh, we're going to call a couple out here between this article and the next one. Uh, one of the main attractions remained Dunfold's replica of the long-lost center steer prototype, presenting as close as we'll get to the original Genesis Land Rover. While many claim it's out there waiting to be rediscovered, ge- uh, general consensus among historians suggests it was either scrapped or reconverted back to World War II Jeep. Other article, I'll switch over to it. Uh, this was uh, Callum Brown, and he kind of singled out uh, four vehicles, and I'll talk about a couple of those. There was a Land Rover series. These were all at the at the, at the Mr. Harridge Land Rover's Legend Show. This one's, I think these were all from the collection. Yeah, these are all our favorites from the Dunsfold Land Rover collection. Land Rover Series 2A V8 88-inch test mule. So this was a factory-fitted unit capable of 0 to 60 miles per hour in under 17 seconds. You make a FAW, but an old <laughs> Landy speed sprint can usually be measured on a sundial. Uh, my bog standard... Yeah, for a Series 2, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. My bog standard Series 3 88-inch breaches uh, 60 miles per hour for an exhausting 35, sec- uh, 35 seconds. So apparently they... Oh, yeah, here's this. The Powered uh, by a prototype V8 Buick engine fitted by Land Rover engineers, this was one of the three test beds constructed for mileage testing with, Land- with Rover's Buick-adopted V8 prior to fitment in a certain Velar project vehicle. I didn't know that. So I guess I had used these uh, Series 2s to start testing out what to do with the with the Velar, which ended up being the Range Rover. Right. And then there was the Range Rover Beaver Bullet. A little discussion about what happened here, but a team of volunteers counteracted the diesel uh, Rangey's negative publicity by breaking not just one world record, but rather 27 of them. Screaming around test tracks, they successfully cracked 100 miles per hour for 24 hours straight. This was the first for any diesel. So this was a Range Rover with a diesel engine in it, and I guess it had, was on Top Gear at some point with Chris uh, Jeff, or Geoff, uh, and there was a I guess he ripped the powertrain to shreds, and it was some negative publicity. So uh, Land Rover folks went out and and did some testing with it and did that. So that's the Beaver Bullet. 
There's the Range Rover CSK number one to celebrate the 20th year of Range Rover production. Land Rover decided to pay direct homage to the brains behind the revolutionary vehicle design, Charles Spencer King. Limited to production run of only 200 examples using the two-door body, the CSK, CSK lays claim as the first sports Range Rover of sorts. Lined with luxury, including bespoke leather and walnut trim, finished in beluga black, the distinctive yes. model. Also introduced the 3.9 liter incarnation of the Rover VA to proceedings available with manual or automatic transmission. And uh, finally, there was the Land Rover Maestro testbed. Basically, that was it. They just had it there, there so you can read about it. There was a Maestro van that they stuck on Freelander running gear uh, to test it out. It was a diesel unit. So that was the uh, Land Rover Legend Show. At Mr. Heritage, did you guys see anything cool. else? Uh, and uh, did you see anything else about it? The I guess there's gonna... neat old stuff there, yeah. And they're gonna do it again. Speaking of neat old stuff, this happened. Uh, what does this happen yesterday? Uh, there was another uh, 70th anniversary rally held. Michael, you were gathering details on it, so I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about it. Oh, great! After I <laughs> closed everything down, <laughs> that was nice. yeah. The, so the obviously the um, the Series One Club in England had their back to the bay rally for the 70th anniversary of of the Land Rover a uh, bunch of series 1s gathered at Red Wharf Bay for the rally were they and, all series 1s well it was the series 1 club and everyone i looked at i think there's some other ones in there if you sort of analyze some of the pictures i'm trying to find I'm the sure video again turn, i'm sure they didn't turn people away yeah uh, but for those who are not familiar, Red Wharf Bay is where legend has it uh, that the uh, Wilkes brothers d- out, did an outline in the sand of what would be the original Land Rover, sketched it in the sand. And so that's when you hear about these back to the bay and Red Wharf Bay. Uh, Land Rover's done it now. It looks like the Series 1 Club has done it of outlining the Land Rover in the sand, this time using actual Series 1 trucks. Right. One of which was the Oxford truck, from what I understand. That, yes, I think you're right, Harold. Yeah, there was, and again, this just happened like yesterday, and I was we were, we were searching for articles to, that we could specifically reference uh, before the podcast and couldn't find any. But I did see, there was a video posted, it uh, looks like by the gentleman who was uh, did the drone photography for the event, and he posted a video, but I haven't seen it on YouTube or anything. But uh yeah, Land Rover. Oh, yeah. Look, in the very beginning of the video, I just noticed it now. Land Rover Series 1, 70th Anniversary, Red Wharf Bay, Anglesey, 23 June 2018. Dylan Vaughn Jones did the video. More so. Oh, we'll post a link in the show notes. Indeed. Indeed. Okay. Good. More uh, more 70th birthday celebrations of Land Rover. If you're, yes, yeah, so if you're new to the show because you are waiting for Malcolm to, to talk about Land Rovers, uh, it's the 70th anniversary of uh, Land Rovers. So before we close out the, the new segment and get into the interview, the entire podcast crew is getting together at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, and we're going to have a little podcast gathering, specifically on June 14th. I should have double-checked the date before I start talking. Uh, July. Uh, perhaps you might want to look. It's July 14th, <laughs> yeah, June 14th. <laughs> okay. Thanks for checking me. Uh, it's July 14th. It is British Car Day at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. Come on out. You'll know where we are. You'll see, you know, you look for the Land Rovers. You'll see us. We'll be there. But myself. And, and, and we'll be specifically around the Oxford Blue 110 with the ridiculous awning. It's the outrageous awning? And, and no, it's, ridic- it's a ridiculous awning. The name has been given. And so we'll be hanging out there and uh, check us out and say hi. And I'll have some podcast stickers and whatnot. And I think we're going to try to do something uh around that to for for the show and 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 talk and but let's say hi that might just be our first ever skypeless episode uh since the early days yes since the yeah distant distant very early days and indeed since we since we're no longer what uh, since our non-heritage podcast shows those heritage podcast shows were pretty bad yeah the, the legacy episodes you might call them oh. All right. So then per, I, perhaps we should mention that our, our, if our listeners need more information on the Grand Prix, they can go to pvgp.org. So check us out at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix British Car Day on July 14th, 2018. Say hi. 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 <laughs> I meant listeners that might show. <laughs> Our guest this month is Malcolm Nance. He's a 30-year U.S. Navy chief, 
Middle East intelligence expert and commentator. He's not here to talk about politics, but about his extensive Land Rover collection. He's been behind the wheel of some interesting and unique Land Rovers, some for work, some for pleasure. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that we have some new listeners, thanks to Malcolm. He has over 400,000 Twitter followers, and I, I have personal experience because he retweeted one of my tweets from my personal account earlier this month. I had to turn off notifications because <laughs> within four hours, I had 53 new followers, 573 retweets, and 1,500 likes. He told me uh, before you know, we things got started, he says, you know, there's a, there's a Nance effect. And I, yeah, that's true. There is, in fact, a Nance effect. So I think we're going to get a, we might get at least some people checking on the podcast, thanks to uh, Malcolm, to listen to him talking about Land Rovers and how he got into Land Rovers. It's a long conversation. If you're a Land Rover person, I'm sure you'll enjoy it. If you're not, thanks for checking in on the show. Welcome back to the Center Steer Podcast. We have a really cool guest. Malcolm Nance is joining us, who's a Middle East terrorism expert. He's an MSNBC analyst, and he's a former U.S. naval intel guy. Is that right, Malcolm? Yeah, that's right. Intelligence. Wonderful. Middle wonderful. East, Africa. Middle, there we go. I follow Malcolm on the Twitters, and uh, I saw him. He posted a photo. I think it was around Memorial Day, if I'm not mistaken. I caught the glimpse of a what I thought was a D90. Turns out to be a D110. And uh, you and I DM'd for a good bit and then geeked out on Land Rovers, and you were nice enough to come on the show. So welcome, Nance. Welcome, 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 Nance. Welcome, Malcolm, uh, <laughs> to the Center Steer Podcast. I really appreciate it. You got a well, nice this... Land Rover background. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast. And, uh, you know, uh, like you said, uh, we were talking earlier. I should be on Guns and Rovers. You know, I've got so many guns and so many Rovers. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I certainly can give you a different perspective uh on the rover world, I've been I've been around them my most of my life. How did you get into Land Rovers? Like, when assume you bleed green, I can tell. When, yeah. When did, when did you get <laughs> yes, the bug? I do. Yeah, I, I got the bug long ago. Like everybody who's our age, right? You know, I when I was a kid, TV show on television, Doctari. <laughs> yep. Right. Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. You know, and and I'm African American. For those who don't know, so you know that you know Doctari and. And shows like that have a, a special place. And but if you see them tooling around, right? They're 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 not tooling around in Toyotas. No. Right? They, <laughs> so any everything down there was a series two. <laughs> right. You know? Right. Mm -hmm. So um so that was uh the the first place uh that I really came to love Land Rovers. And it's really funny because I was in Philadelphia recently. I have a uh a Defender one ten that I have there. A little girl at an elementary school comes walking by she's about three years old and she goes mommy safari car you <laughs> right and it's like god kids still get it uh, you know yeah. that's what what rovers are all about absolutely indeed they are and so you, you i assume then you rekindled when you got to the military would, would that be correct yeah yeah i would actually <laughs> one of my uh uh, somebody who I like immensely, who's a who's a writer, very early uh, was one of the first uh, was one of the first North American Spec 110 owners, and that's uh, Robert Young Pelton. Uh, he's Mr. World's Most Dangerous Places. He's a journalist. He's been all over the place. Uh, I mean, all over the place. And he runs a a web blog, a website and blog called Dangerous Places. But he wrote a book called The World's Most Dangerous Places for like ten editions. And he would just go to the worst, most horrific places in the world. And so I saw him uh, up in Huntington Beach, and he, he had a brand new, you know, NAS spec <laughs> 110, all white. And I was like, you rat bastard. <laughs> I would really like one of those. And so for, from that minute on, I was like, I'm getting one of those. And uh, and then it just went ballistic. <laughs> you know, I got more than one. So what was the what was the very first one that you had? <laughs> Actually, to tell you the truth, I mean I've operated more than I than than I've owned. So because I work uh, in mid Middle East and Sub Saharan Africa, North Africa, South Asia, in counterterrorism, you know, and around the NGO world, uh, we you know there were rovers everywhere. Uh, before I actually owned one. As a matter of fact, the first one I ever went in that wasn't, uh, you know, after that Robert Young Pelton thing was a um, was for the, the the Peace Corps in Papua New Guinea in the Northern Highlands in the in the town of Leh. Oh, no, it wasn't Leh. It was Goroka. 
And uh, they had this beautiful 110, uh, you know, with a, you know, but if you know anything about New Guinea, New Guinea is actually a very violent place. <laughs> and okay. If you're not part of a tribe, you know, they're afraid of every uh, of every other person that's there. They're mortally terrified of each individual because of their what they call the one talk system. One talk is pidgin English for one talk, which is how they taught them to say tribe. Because they didn't think that these people could learn actual English. So they thought of this horrific baby pigeon English that they speak at the speed of Chinese. And, you know, uh, so when I was there, you know, my first ride was like they got picked me up and they were like, hey, I'm here in my 110 with riot cage all around the windows. And I'm like, what's with the riot cage uh, screens? And they go, well... That's because, you know, we have rocks and trees and the six to six. And I go, six to six? And he goes, yeah, that's when the guys start getting drunk at six in the evening till six in the morning. Oh. And I thought it was a joke. <laughs> it's not a joke. Oh. <laughs> you know, if you're on the road, you know, and, you know, they they yeah. rob you. These, wow. They call them rascals, the bandits. Mm. And they will smash your windows with their empty beer and whiskey bottles <laughs> and take your car. And go sell it for you know fifty bucks, and then continue the big drinkathon. Well, you, you ever had you ever had the occasion to read uh, the driver's manual that's written in Talk Piscine? Uh, no, I it's, haven't. Uh, so it's you know, hilarious. Uh, it's oh my hilarious. God. You car make you be go car Suppo- fast foot pedal brake. The part that gets me is. <laughs> Suppose you Kisim Bagarap Narapella driver. Uh, suppose you can Kisim name Narapella driver. No can pite him. Oh my God! You speak pissing it. Wow! Where did were you were you stationed there? Were you a v, RPV or something? Uh, no, I uh, in an earlier life I worked for a suspension manufacturer that had an Australian distributor, and he did a lot of work in in uh, in New Guinea. Oh yeah. So he told all kinds of wild ass stories, and oh, then later God. I took I took a linguistics class. They talked about uh, talk piscine. Oh uh, yeah yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh wanna... yeah. Let me tell you something about New Guinea. I, mean, I spent my entire career in, in, in counterintelligence and working against terror or counterterrorism, working against terrorists and everything. New Guinea is so weird. I could spend the rest of my life studying the security environment in New Guinea and wouldn't be even marginally done at the end of 50 years, right? <laughs> you just yeah. wouldn't even be close. That place is crazy. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you go there, that's an adventure. <laughs> I mean, wow. you know, your, your cameraman or your driver will be talking to you in the next minute or rob you blind. So you got to you got to become buddies with people there. You wow. know, helps if you got a 110, though. Yeah. Everything's better with a 110, isn't it? Not sure. Of course. You know, so long as, there's a lot of parts there. That's the best part. Well, let me tell you about the first Rover that I bought uh, because I, I driven reams of them. And then later I'll tell you Rovers that I saw. In, in my career, as a matter of fact, I'm supposed to be negotiating or I'm supposed to be uh, writing a column for Land Rover monthly mm-hmm. um, every, or, you know, quarterly or something about that called Spy Rover, where Ooh. I talk about, you know, clandestine and <laughs> super sneaky special vehicles that I've seen all around the world or jury rigged, you know, defenders and high caps and things like that. I've, I've been around. I've seen them all. And I take pictures of every one of them. And there are countries around the world that have just have some of the funkiest, craziest rovers. You can believe the kind of guns you can get on a, a 110. <laughs> but uh, the first one I've ever bought, uh, I just uh, a couple of years ago, I moved back from seven years in Abu Dhabi. And one day I was out at a supermarket and I saw a Santana, you know, that's the Spanish build yeah, model, kit. Yeah, 110. Right. And I was like, oh, oh, look at that. There's a Santana 110. and you know, and I, I thought about it, I go, no, nah, I'm going to buy one. I want to buy my own. You know, I'm going to buy a good one. So I had this really cheap Renault, <laughs> uh, Renault 307, just the worst car in the history of mankind. Is there you know? any other kind? Oh, my God. Well, the when the, 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 the summer, I was literally driving down a highway at 80 miles per hour where the entire liner fell on top of me <laughs> and literally obscured my vision. <laughs> <laughs> it was like 120 degrees outside all the glue melted and oh. it was just like i'm getting I, we gave it away <laughs> that's how bad the car was 
Well, you, so, you lost you lost me at the 80 miles an hour. I didn't think they would do that. Oh, yeah. Well, you can make those things do anything when you go downhill with a wind behind oh, you. Okay. But I said, that's it. And I told my wife, I said, hey, you know, I saw a 110. And in, in, the, in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi, they have a, um, uh, a online website that's like Craigslist called Dubizzle. And Dubizzle. Du nice. They yeah, go to <laughs> D-U-B-I-Z-Z-L-E dot com. <laughs> Uh, and you can see all the cars that are for sale in the UAE. And the fascinating thing when you go into the Rover section is you can see there will be like 400 Range Rovers. <laughs> okay? Wow. Not joking. 400 Range Rovers. Then like 20 or 30 dif uh, discos. Right? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you right now, if I were to go and do Bizzle right now, there's probably six at a maximum of any model of defender series or whatever wow. six so you know so out of like 700 cars for sale in the uae <laughs> excuse me defenders or series are very hard to come by because they're called over there they call them jumal inglesi right the english camel <laughs> and the the first cars the series ones and series uh, twos that Sheikh Zayed, the, the George Washington, the founding father of the UAE, had, are, are all preserved. They're in museums. The army keeps a whole flight of these Series 2 uh, 109s and, and uh, 88 inchers for, for displays and, 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 you know, harking back to their English colonial, you know, liberation theme. And so those things are really taken care of. And so there's very few, there's actually a lot there. Mm -hmm. You just don't see people using them, you know, but there's a, you know, I mean, right now you can go out and you can buy a 20, 2017, 2018 last off the lot limited edition, you know, heritage 110, right? Mm -hmm. In Dubai, but you're going to pay money for it. So there, you know, so I, I went there and I, I looked around Dubizzle and I found um, this guy, he had a, a, 2005 TD5, uh, which is very nice. Yeah. And, and you know, I remember when he came around the corner, I was at a mall waiting for him, and I saw it. It was a silver TD5. We called her, for some strange reason, Minerva. <laughs> Too much Harry Potter, I think. <laughs> uh, Minerva McGonagall. And uh, <laughs> so I was like, you know, and I heard the diesel of the TD5, but I was like, he's a diesel too. <laughs> so, because most defenders in the UAE are petrol. Uh -huh. Most are, you know, the older ones, right. all the ones that I have are 3.8 liter V8s right. or 3.9 yeah, 3. Uh, no, 3 liter V8s. And so they, for their fleets, they didn't buy diesels. And all of the diesel one tenths that are over there are, are privately held or the French army. And the French army has all brand new, uh, you know, the, the, the foreign legion moved to Dubai, uh, to Abu Dhabi. And uh, they have really nice tan and, you know, camel camouflaged um, 110 diesels, like 2017, 2016, 2017. It's very nice. So, uh, so when that truck came rolling around, I was like, all right, that's it. I'm buying that truck. <laughs> you know, and it was relatively cheap, too. So I bought that truck and then. It, it was very nicely kitted out. Uh, it had a snorkel, um, which came in handy because it, come December, you know, the, the Middle East British engineers, well, you know, the old saying that it never rains in the Middle East, right? So they didn't engineer any of the underpasses for, you know, sloughing off water or rain, you know, rain drainage. So every December, there would be a rain and it would flood Dubai. You know, it would flood all the underpasses in Abu Dhabi. And Ooh. one day I got caught in one and I was the only moving vehicle, <laughs> you know, yeah. the only moving vehicle, 20 swamped vehicles. And I was picking people up left and right. You know, they're crawling through the passenger window, nice. <laughs> nice. getting up on the roof rack. <laughs> and I was like, oh, uh -huh. cam English camel <laughs> swims. Yes. So uh, <laughs> so that, we drove that car around forever. And then um, we we realized when we wanted to bring it back, go back to the United States, that we couldn't, right? Because it was a 2005, 
So we started our big hunt for my wife wanted one too. She was just like, well, you've got one. I want one. She loves the defendant. Oh. She likes the height. Yeah. She likes the width. Yeah. She likes that she dominates, you know, all other cars. <laughs> you know, when you've got a yeah. roll cage on, you're just like, I could even roll over. So, yeah. and we did a lot of camp camping there out in the desert, a lot of camping and, and dune bashing. And to give you a, a fun idea, our TD5 was manual. And one day we went as out. As it one, should be. As it should be. Uh, and, you know, so we had the five speed. And um, one day we went out to, uh, to Lewa. No, it wasn't Lewa. It was another place. But this giant, giant sand dunes. And it was an introduction. And every other car that was with us was a, was a land cruiser, these tricked out land cruisers. So we, we realized we couldn't take the Minerva back to the States. And so we started looking for other defenders and we started finding them. <laughs> and I mean, you know, we needed something that was 25 years old. And at that time, that was 1989 or earlier. And so we started looking around and we found the 1986. That's, we were at our, 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 our repair shop that's up in a town called Sharjah. And uh, they had this horrible, horrible orange and white Defender 110 and a Defender 90. And the 90 was a 97 fully automatic Japanese spec. Yeah. And so uh, I was, so we bought them and it turns out they were like, these were cars that belonged to the stable of Sheikh Maktoum, the ruler of Dubai. Oh. And as soon as we registered that car, man, first we had to paint them. There was no way we we're going to have like, Orange rims. Oh, oh <laughs> orange no, please no. Lights. We painted them all white, and we on, on one car we kept the orange, you know, spotlight covers, and we call that car Baby Duck. That's the Defender ninety, <laughs> Baby Duck. And uh, all of our cars have names because I go by the English way of, of being a Defender owner. Yes. And so, uh, so we bought Baby Duck, and then we bought the other one, the white one, which was all white, and uh, and that was really nicely done except that they had taken out the traditional dash and had put in like this pimp dash with like <laughs> multi multi-colored lights and fuel gauges i'm not joking oh. when you illuminated it it pinball flash oh, right on pimp mobile oh. and so and this one had a 4.6 liter range rover engine okay. and uh no yeah 4.6 right and because they dune bashed, right? They would just take these things and they just fly up sand dunes. We bought that car uh, after, and after, but we had to put the original, uh, the original V8 engine, petrol engine back inside it. Uh, and that one's called Kimba. And we sold that when we got here to the States. But that belonged to Sheikh uh, Maktoum of Dubai. And his registration didn't even have a number on it, right? We got the registration card with the car and it just said, Sheikh such and such Maktoum, uh, His Royal Highness. There you go. <laughs> That's it. Yep. Right? Yep. And it's just like, who's this? Can I see your registration card? I heard of. His Royal Highness. Those, the Emiratis were crazy about that car. They wanted that car like nobody's business. But if there's any one thing we learned working in the Emirates is, you know, their eyes are bigger than their wallets. Mm -hmm. And these are the kind of people that would take possession of the car and not pay you. Oh, and nice. um, yeah, really. So, so we bought that car back to the States, Kimba. But back to my original story. So one day we took Minerva out dune bashing in, in the desert in, in Lewa, uh, the Lewa Desert, which is the part of the empty quarter. And we were with a Land Rover Club and everybody else was in, you know, uh, it wasn't Land Rover Club, was it? Uh, du uh, UAE 4x4 Club. Mm -hmm. And these guys were all there in these fully tricked out, Land cruisers and you know Toyota FJs, all full automatic, and here we are in a 110 manual, and which was way way more interesting <laughs> because you know when you go up a short hill, right, you got to really power up that thing, but yep. once you crest, yep, you got to really power back on mm -hmm. that thing, oh right? yeah, because mm -hmm. you just start sliding down. And as a matter of fact, one guy came there, and I don't know why, but he came there in like um, like a Pajero 
you know, uh, a Mitsubishi Pajero. Oh. And the whole front really? bumper broke away because it was plastic, right? And he just thought, oh, it's a four by four. I can go dune bashing in these giant mountains here, mm -hmm. you know, sand dunes. And you're talking hundreds of miles of sand dunes, but they had this loop, this 25 mile loop that took literally eight hours to get around. Wow. It was That's not, like... it was not a game. Wow. That's like bringing a slingshot to a gunfight, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, no, it's like bringing a plastic water pistol that where the barrel will break off. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, so you just squirt it, you know, and it shoots out the back. Yeah. Uh, but this Pajero, and I mean the whole front plastic end came off right up to the lights. Wow. <laughs> and all he could do was throw it in the back of his car. <laughs> and the, the, the team leader said, well, uh, it was an Austrian guy who was hilarious. Team leader said, well, you can't go any further. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. He goes, no, your entire radiator is exposed, mm -hmm. right? You are literally exposed. Your right. next downhill will smash out, you know, your car. Yeah. He goes, We're gonna, I'm going to put a toe on you and just stay off your brake and, and let me tow you back. And we had only gotten about three miles. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to 110. And thinking that I was going to be the last one the whole time. No, I, I did pretty well. Um, nice. but I learned a couple of value le valuable lessons. There's an enormous bowl in this place. Gi I mean, a, 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 a gigantic, like 1000 foot drop Whoa. into an enormous bowl. That's about, I'd say a quarter of a mile wide. And the cars that went down were like, you know, those little scenes with the ants and a tiny car down there. Right. Not even like Tonka. You know, not even like matchbox size, right? Like a fraction of that <laughs> down at the bottom of this bowl. And the Austrian guy goes, here's what you got to do. You got to go down this as fast as you can, fast as you can. And then you hit the bottom of the bowl and then you spin. He goes, you, you, you put it up into fourth and you go as fast as you can around the rim. And you throw yourself up and over that top sand dude, right? <laughs> and I go... Okay, right. I'll try. And this this Ashin guy goes, he pulls full Yoda on me. He goes, do not try. Do. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I go, all right, screw it. So I, I actually, I mean, we were going down so fast. I had to go to, you know, like third, super, super, super fast. And, you know, when I got down there, I mean, we're full bore, barreling, Damn. barreling down this hill. And then, you know, we get to the bottom. There's three cars down there. We got to miss them, right? Oh. We cut left and we do the full centrifuge, which is, your, which is what's happening. You're gaining speed and you're slingshotting yourself. Oh, sure. right. Well, we didn't make it. Oh. And uh, we didn't make it. So we had to keep going up. So what we had to do now is seesaw, where you yeah. barrel, 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 barrel up the hill, then go into neutral and let the car roll backwards down the hill until you go back up the other side. Then you throw it into gear, and then you floor it, and you fly all the way down. And I almost went through these two idiots who hadn't moved their car. They see me coming down. They're just like, oh, this is very interesting. And uh, so finally on the third try, I seesawed enough to get back into the centrifuge, and and run what you're doing is you're corkscrewing your way up a little little by little by little until right. you break the ridge mm -hmm. and i break the ridge and i get over the top and boom dead stop bottomed out right oh. <laughs> <laughs> but i'm at the top of this ridge and so you know they we all had to get out and dig out because I'm, I'm on the bottom and the, and the truck's got a, you know a two inch lift on it you know and and they were just like, well, this is just the bottom. You just missed the part, you know, where you we needed you to go about four feet to the right. There's a little gap mm. that they had all dug out. And so the guy had to go all the way down. This was a, a bowl that wasn't so bad, uh, you know, maybe 200 feet deep. And he just put a, a tow a tow rope on me and, and I had jade rings on the bottom. So and he just jerks me off. Right. And then just enough. And he makes me stop just over the crest of the hill he comes he takes stuff off and then he goes haul ass <laughs> so now i gotta do it again but now i've got the feel of this right and i go down i do it again on a sh much shorter bowl but that bowl is phenomenal then we get to the end of the ride 
and at the end of the ride, we have a big down down. We have a big drink a thon, and and of course I couldn't drink, but you know have food and and everything. And then we do a night navigation out. Whoa! <laughs> Which I've done. You know I like night navigation. I, I've done night nav. You know I've driven with NVGs, night vision goggles. But you know these, you know these Toyotas and and stuff. They're all flooring it, right? And they find these these uh, oil field roads, you know, that are there, and they're just like doing eighty miles per hour on these things. <laughs> and I've just got to try to watch which way their lights jig to the right or jig to the left because there's gonna be a hole. There could be a you know a giant sand dune. A couple of times you hit these dunes and you're pulling the full Rat Patrol, right? You're oh. just you're like, Holy, <laughs> why didn't he tell me? And finally we finished, and it was the most physically exhausting Land Rover ride wow. I'd ever done. Wow. And uh, I've done Land Rover experience, uh, nothing. Yeah. All right. This thing, it was eight hours of heavy concentration. It was about a hundred degrees outside during the daytime digging out. We weren't hydrating enough until the end. And then bare knuckle, right? I mean, you got to drive your goddamn car Damn. And, and then boom, you're on a highway. We're like, oh, whoa, we we can go to the we can go to the quickie quick stop <laughs> and get us an ice cream. But uh, you know, uh, but the thing is, years later, I would go. A couple of years later, I would go into a North African country uh, that um, and and on uh, for for work. <laughs> I like how you that, say that. That had a lot of layers. I well, well, you'll figure it out. A North African country south of Italy. <laughs> uh, that had a lot of Land Rovers in it. I was helping these guys operationalize some of their their assets. I actually have some really great pictures of, of these defenders with guns. And it's also the secret land of where there are all these Land Rovers that are insane, man. Mm. Mad Maxes. So, wow. but that was bare knuckle driving, bare yeah. knuckle. And just to imagine doing a a, 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 a crossing, you know, where it's just up the sand, up the, the dune, down the dune, up the dune, down the dune, dig out, up the dune, down the dune. And then I learned a valuable lesson also. Get a F and roll cage. Because <laughs> little did I know, I mean, I was just, I didn't know that they were going to take me on a route. This was not considered the most serious of all their routes, but it was one of the bigger ones. Mm -hmm. Uh, the bowl is without a doubt the the biggest one and one of the biggest ones in the Middle East. You know that that people can go around driving on, right? There's stuff out there no one ever sees except on satellite. And then I, I we looked at my wife and I was like, roll cage. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> you yeah. know mm -hmm. that could have ended up very badly. Very poorly. And yes. defenders don't have the greatest you know roof support. So and really? sure enough, yeah, well, I've heard that. Yeah. Sure enough. Yeah. Somebody in so I soon joined the 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 UAE Land Rover Owners Club, of which I have my 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 wheel cover, uh, and my 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 shirt that I wear to rallies and stuff. I, I represent the UAE Land Rover Owners Club, nice, nice. and um, with our double camels. Oh, and that's cool. Um, now that's cool. <laughs> sort of cool. Someone's gonna steal that wheel cover. I can feel it. Yeah. But um. But when we went out on those, one guy came out in a brand new, at that time it was 2012, 110, uh, you know, it was a TDI Puma, and flipped it right on its head, uh, crushed it right down to the doors. Uh, and I mean, he was just on a demo ride. Uh, he was just like, hey, I got my new 110, I'm just going to pull it over this hill. And he uh -huh. just turned his wheel the wrong way, and it rolled. Uh, and... You know, and, yep. and ever since then, it's like roll cage. Yep. As a matter of fact, I have um, uh, Patriot Performance roll cage on my my current 110. Yeah, you got and, and a spare. And a spare. One for sale. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's interested in Malcolm Nance's roll cage, right? Yeah, it's yeah. in Philadelphia. Okay, there we go. Yeah, there's a good community in, in the Philly and the D.C. area. So you bought the '86 and the '87. You, you, and your wife have one, and then you did you bring yeah. those both to the U.S. And then what do you what did you get from there? Because you sold one of them, right? Well, actually, I had eight when we left, and uh, we started shipping over our cars. So the first you car we bought, eight? Back was oh, we got to pause car. on that. You had eight Land Rovers, yeah, in the UAE eight Defenders. Okay, and right let me let right me on. go through them all. That's we about had, the right uh, number. 
we had the <laughs> we had the 97 D90 uh 97 d90 then we had the 88 110 that the kimba mm-hmm. was its name the d90 was baby duck uh kimba is the white 110 which we sold when we got here in the states uh then my truck which is bad wolf which was a doctor who illusion we like it's you more and more i like you more yeah and more. it's it's an 85 yes it's an 85 110 now let me uh, and I'll tell you about that truck. It's a little famous because I made it famous. Uh, 3,375 kilometers on it when we bought it. Damn. And it was a gardener's car from the palace, uh, the, the Fujera palace of one of the sheikhs. And the cars who in their fleet were not allowed to leave the palace ground. So this guy drove five kilometers per day for five years. Wow. And then they swapped the fleet out, and that car was in covered storage. Wow. And I have pictures of the day that I found it. And then as soon as I went in and looked at it, there's no rust, really. You know, there was no. because they used the air conditioning. These, by the way, were um interesting fact about the Middle East models. These are the ones with the dash that has the built-in air conditioner. Oh. The same right. now, the early 80s dashes w- later would be discontinued, except in the Middle East model. And would only return as the North American spec dash huh. with the air conditioner built in that was internal to the to the engine compartment. Right. So uh, there, that's very cool. And uh, so so my truck is Bad Wolf. So that one was the very low mileage truck. I think I still have about 6,000 miles on it. It just spent a year getting refurbished. Um, then my wife's uh, 84 110 is called the Gopher because it's brown. Uh, so it's like the Caddyshack gopher nice. and, uh, that's in Philadelphia. Uh, then I have a black, very interesting, uh, 110 hardtop two door. That was the, the personal property of the British REME. That's the Royal engineers, uh, Land Rover special vehicles tech for the UAE special forces. Whoa. And that guy put that thing up for sale on Dubizzle. And he couldn't bring it to, he was moving to Australia and he couldn't bring it to Australia. Uh-huh. And when I bought it, it was all white, but it was, had five inch lift and he had put in boxes in the back and he had rigged it for around the world. Wow. Uh, it has two fuel tanks, long range. It has a special long range fuel tank on it. Um, and it's a military hard top, Damn. Uh, you know, but it was three point, you know, 3.6 uh, or 3.9 liter V8 you know, as opposed to all the rest. But as soon as I saw that truck and he put like a competition clutch on it. And and then he goes, I got to leave. I've got to sell this truck. I'm asking <laughs> this amount. I think it was $7,000. Uh, um, that's all? But what? the truck from back to front, bottom to top was filled with sparers and stuff oh. that he got. Oh. And he wanted to know if I wanted an Isuzu engine that was on the ground. Oh. And he finally decided to take the Isuzu engine to Australia with him because all the Parentes have those. Right. And right. I was just like, yeah, I'll buy your truck. Yeah, I think right. I can afford that. Twist my arm. And, you know, and he said, he goes. The spare parts are worth more than that. The spare parts were worth way more than that because I got, I tried to sell them online. But, you know, there's a lot of guys in the States, they own 110s. They don't even name them. <laughs> you know, I mean, I got a lot more uh familiarity with brits and australians you know mm-hmm. south africans so when i run into those guys and i start dropping names they're like holy christ that was in your truck <laughs> um so this guy had tricked that truck out um it, it was called doug d-u-g like doug the dog from from the movie up <laughs> so, <laughs> you are my master i love you i've only just met you i love you so so i bought that uh, and it was chock full of of all sorts of goodies, including you know I I, I still have it. I have a uh, a, a full scale um, freezer in there, a forty five liter freezer with a ten liter freezer extension on top, <laughs> and 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 all sorts of stuff. The bumper system and winch alone, the winch uh, was um, the winch came from a Humvee, mm. and I so, when I got this thing, I realized. He got this stuff from work. <laughs> okay. mm-hmm. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he paid for this truck. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And so when he, when I drove up in my in Minerva in my silver one ten, the first thing he said to me, he said, "I knew you're a Yank, and I know you said you wanted to look at a Defender, but I was going to see what car you drove up in, and you drove up in a Defender, so I'll sell this to you." And I, so I'm like, <laughs> "Well, right. let's talk." And he started talking to me about Land Rover special vehicles. And it turns out we had a, a shared history in which some of the more special vehicles. Uh, that we knew about were were part of his history. So he 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 was awesome guy. He gave me like tons, maybe fifteen thousand dollars in spares. Wow! And and the truck is awesome. So and we drove that truck around all the time. Five five inch lift, like I said, it was just huge with these giant two, you know, giant tires. And we take that thing to the desert all the time. We left a full desert camping kit in it at all times. And we just have these giant, you know, parties out in the desert on Saturday and Friday, Saturday nights. Uh, that's Doug. Uh, Doug has since been repainted black and it's coming back to the States. We left it there for a couple of years. It's it's fully ready and it's been renamed Simba <laughs> because it's black. So, uh, but we're probably going to just keep calling it Doug. And then the 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 piece de resistance of my of my collection. Finally, we get is, to it. Yeah, is the uh, is the Big Bird. Uh, <laughs> that's its name. It's a Omani Air Force fire tender pump truck mm. that pri before they 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 had to take the roll cage and the pump, not the roll cage, the rolling windows and the pump out of the back to make it street worthy. And the guy who owned it. Uh, lived in Muscat. He was a Brit, great guy, but he wasn't driving this truck. And there was, you know, tsunami out there, and almost a tsunami out there. And it, it was just sitting in water for a little bit. So I went out, and it was famous in our Land Rover club. And somebody in the states offered what the guy offered to sell it for like fourteen thousand dollars. And the guy in the states was like, "No, twelve thousand is the most I'll pay." <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And it is a Defender 150. It is a 6x6 six six vehicle that is, in fact, a Sandringham Motor Company, wow. uh, SMC, Sandringham 6 vehicle. Right. And Sandringham was a Land Rover special vehicle subcontractor that did series versions of this truck. They were the ones who did the half track, the Minotaur. Oh, yeah. Um, okay, they yeah. were the, uh, there is a, there are Sandringham six. There's a, there's a Land Rover website called six by six appeal.co.uk, uh, which is for six wheeled Land Rovers, mainly Sandringham and utility truck Sandinghams. Uh, this was a fire tender. And, um, I happen to know one in France right now that's for sale that is, will not be able to make it to the States. They turned it into a pickup truck. And this thing is a station wagon. So, you know, whatever the VIN is, but they want 50,000 for that. Un and I think it has, I don't think it has the original engine in it either. Mm. But I saw this, this truck on a, on a Land Rover website, uh, UAE Land Rover. And uh, there's an Emirati there who's a lawyer who is just the most amazing guy. He hand restores series once. And he owns one of Sheikh Zayed's former series ones that had, like I said, this guy's the George Washington of the UAE. And he's a lawyer. And when the, the UAE government wanted to restore them, they were going to send them all off to Solihull. And he convinced them to let them let him do Sheikh Zayed's personal truck. So they sent it to Solihull for the for the basics. And then they gave it to this guy because he would keep all the Arab touches, you know, like mm -hmm. the shisha hookah in the car or <laughs> things like that. All righty then. You know, all the cool stuff. The priorities. And so the Sandringham 6 or Defender 150, because that's the wheelbase. It's 150. It's got six wheels. <laughs> it had all the original tires, those camel uh, camel tread tires, the Michelin X XZLs, I think they are. <clears throat> and I right. had six spare here. I saw. I gave them to um, I don't know if you guys know Travis at um, at uh, British uh, uh, British uh, four by four in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania, no, out near Lancaster. That's, that's, that's Trevor, is it not? Trevor, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm Travis. Yeah, yeah, I know him. Yeah, Trevor. And uh, oh, I know Trevor. 
<laughs> Trevor just gave me my car back after a year. Uh, but he got so much work. I mean, he just has so much work there. It's insane. You, you know, um, his dad worked for Joseph Lucas. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I didn't. So he, he's got pedigree. Oh, oh awesome. So long story very short, um, I, the 6 by 6 and that, that black 110 hardtop are coming back to the United States this year. And the key thing is documentation because, you know, it's VIN plate and it's serial number do not reflect a 6 by 6 right? Hey. It's a 110 4 by 4 Of course it is. And yeah. it's turned over. It comes off the Solihull lines. It is turned over to Land Rover Special Vehicles or at that time Sandringham which has since been taken over by Penman Special Vehicles. And so all of those six-wheeled discoveries and Range Rover fire tenders, you know, crash trucks, mm -hmm. they're all run by that company now. Mm -hmm. But I found three examples of this truck in their fire livery. There's one in Gibraltar, which is funny because I'd spent a lot of time in Gibraltar, and I just never saw that truck, <laughs> you know, the 6 by 6 Defender fire truck with the pump in the back uh -huh. and the ladders on the top. Well, and I then guess if nothing was on fire, you wouldn't see it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, if I had that damn thing, I'd just sit outside in, the, in a chair <laughs> next isn't, to it all day. Isn't there a right. red red fire truck for sale in the U.S.? Uh, a couple months ago? It's quite possible, it, but it's not a 6x6. Six six. It's a full, I think it's a 4x4 four four fire truck. I think you're If right, it's you're the right. one I'm thinking of, I and it looks right. awesome. It's like pristine. You know, which is how you can have them delivered. You know, right. you got to have them in their original configuration-ish. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You can get away with a fire truck. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's another one in the Ghana Forest Service, Forestry Service. I have a photo of it. And that one is identical to ours, where they place seats in the back in replacement for the fire pump. Mm -hmm. And so the original configuration of the, the, the 6 by 6 was it was seat 6, and then have a giant pump in the two, the double bed area in the back. Okay. And so, of course, it wasn't, it's not allowed to be street worthy with a fire pump in the back. So they pulled the pump and we put in four sets of seats. Nice. So it's now legal and, uh, and it's seats 17. <laughs> <laughs> of course it does. That seems like that'd be a Wait, good camping vehicle. No, I'm sorry. That's 15, seats 15. Does that mean you need a bus driver's license to operate it? Yeah, something like, well, you know, maybe we'll take one of the seats out. But that's why we call it Big Bird. It's bright yellow. And I had, I did have to, to repair the bulkhead. I had to replace the bulkhead on that one. So, you know, when I was restoring it, the, everything after the driver's seat was, was immaculate. It was, there was no rust, really, other than the basic underside surface rust. Um, and then... You know, the, the bulkhead, because it was in Oman, which is the ocean, right? That's the Indian Ocean, is very different than in the UAE, where it's nothing, right? It's 120 degrees all the time, you know? So we had to replace, the bulkhead was, was corroded, and I could have repaired it with a patch kit. And so I asked our guy at our garage in Sharjah, and he goes, oh, bulkhead, I know where there's a bulkhead. And I go, okay, well, you know, this is a 1985. He goes, no, this 85, chief, you know. I'm like, okay. He goes to a guy that he knows, and there is a secret rover underground of Emiratis who keep the old rovers, and they just keep them in their houses. They do not drive these things around. There's one guy there who has just, he has an original, real Pink Panther, and we've checked that number. What? <laughs> okay. What? Yeah. There's nice. a there's there's a, there's a couple of the shakes and I'm not not the rainbow shake. Uh, he has like ten different rovers. There's another guy up in charge who was a general, and he just kept every military rover there is. And he has three of these like heavy machine gun lightweights with the machine gun down the middle, <laughs> you know, right and a recoil no recoilless rifle. Another one has twin thirty cals and one has a fifty cal. <laughs> and they're original factory left-hand drive lightweights, Whoa. Mm -hmm. you know, and they're all, they got the big spotlights on the, on the, on the wheel wells. And I'm like, and you know, I didn't even know about the, you know, the Emirati Rover underground until I met this lawyer who, um, who was, uh, trying to get this 127 shipped off to, uh, 
to Libya, the guy who, who restores all these cars. And so I guess using the rover underground and talking to this guy, he goes, I have a 1985 Vulcan. We were like, oh, yeah? Where? And he goes, oh, he says, do you want it? And I'm like, yeah, you know? And he says, okay, you know, some insane amount of money, like like $800. And uh, it's so up comes this box, and it, it says charge of police, right? It has the delivery components on it and everything. The box was spares delivered in 1985. Wow. But no one drives these cars, so no one needs the spares. Wow. So he got a in-the-box factory bulk head for a 1985 left-hand drive 110. And he sold it to you for how much? <laughs> it was just like, we'll install that. <laughs> so that's what we did. We installed that's And like now it's pristine. Everything from the gas pedal forward. Everything forward of the bulkhead. I mean, we replaced the bulkhead. But all I was just refurbished. We original dash everything, and we just cleaned up the frame. Uh, we did all the suspension forward. The only thing we couldn't do and didn't do at that time was try to put the six six wheel drive into operation. Mm. Uh, because you know what, there's some things they do really well over there when you have you know 200 Bangladeshi mm -hmm. auto mechanics, and there's some things they don't do very well. And, and, you know, a, a drivetrain like that, I would want to get that done in the States. <laughs> you know? Right. By, by a truck company that knows. Right. How to, I have the original Sandringham 6 operator's manual and maintenance manual and parts manual. Wow. Nice. Uh, that came with the truck. And it says down the spine, handwritten Sandringham 6. <laughs> how we know what it is. <laughs> and in fact, um, I contacted a guy who used to work at SMC and he sent me a set of plates that are original to the truck to H Sandringham six that were never uh, put on, hmm. uh, you know, the, the original side plates and, and things like that that say Sandringham six. Oh, so cool. when that truck finally makes it into the United States, you know, through customs, which is going to be a task because, you know, we've got to explain the customs that it was a four by four, then it was sent to Sandringham, and Sandringham converted it to 6x6. Six six. And then that is the actual vehicle, is a Sandringham Motor Corporation 6x6. Six six. Nice. <laughs> That'll be fun. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. As you know, they've gotten a little more uh, strict in the last uh, several years. So, yeah. Oh, well, I was around yeah. for the great rent Land Rover Jihad. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, well, in fact, uh, in fact, my car was – who was it? Uh, who runs um, – uh, Russ? Oh, you're thinking of Doug? Doug, Doug. Crowder? Yeah, yeah, Doug Crowder. Uncle Doug. Uh, Un Doug Uncle Crowder. Doug, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Doug imported my first three vehicles. He, he's good. He's, he's and, got a high success rate. And let me tell you something. We went, so we're overseas, and he says, put your FaceTime on. And we went around Kimba, the first truck, and he goes, engine, out, get the original. Yeah. Fortunately for me, because... The Arabs like these big Range Rover engines in there. All the, th you know, all the V8 petrols are new, are in a stack <laughs> laying off to the side. There you go. You know? And so I got a nearly new V8 petrol engine put nice. back in there, and it, run, it ran like a champ forever. Nice. New carbs, everything. And he's just like, okay, get this off of it, get that off of it don't clean the interior <laughs> and i'm like there's four inches of sand in there and he's like awesome right. leave it leave it <laughs> leave it yep you know uh, yep. we had to take off all the lights we had to take out the pimp you know the pimp pinball That's dash right. and put we found you know uh my our garage does so many rovers but they're all new ones where they take out all the original stuff mm -hmm. and right. pimp them out so he said reams uh, of stuff. As a matter of fact, he had the original odometer and dash for that truck when they took out the pimp mobile, made cool. it into a pimp mobile, and just restored that. You know, we restored each of these trucks to their original con configuration as per the VIN plate, uh, and and we got all three of those back here. So now the six by six uh, Land Rover Monthly is going to do an article on it, um, and Sam Watson, who I met in Cairo. Uh, you know, he he's he's an awesome guy. Uh, he goes all around the world driving 
you know, driving mm-hmm. defenders and his car and freaking Nepal and mm-hmm. China. And, oh, yeah. you know, he's out in Cairo all the time and he yeah. lives in the UAE now. So he's going to just, oh, okay. as a matter of fact, we, we just uh, met and he looked, he inspected all of my trucks a few months ago. And he was just like with Big Bird and he goes, we need a we need to fly a photographer in here for this, <laughs> you know, to get those sand dune shots of the front wheels going over the sand dune oh, and nice. the rear four wheels in the back. So I look forward to, to doing that and getting that uh, 150 back here into the States for my collection. So oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yes. Are you, you going to use Uncle Doug again? Probably, you know, he's what I like about him is, I mean, he brings it through Dundalk and I've, I've, I've met yeah, yeah. other people who bring it through Jersey, Bayonne and places like that. Uh, my friend Gabor Antalix, he, uh, you know, he used to have a place in Philadelphia, Gabor, and he's out of that business now. Uh, but he brought in, you know, some guys bought in these 97 Japanese spec D90s and he was just like, got to go back. I don't know how you got them in this country, but. They're all 98s, you know, and my D90 can't come to the States because that barcode tag was cut out and it's VIN is exactly 17 days after the last date that a U.S. spec D90 is legit. (laughs) So you can bring Japanese spec cars in, but they better be before September 30th, 97, if I'm not mistaken. And they're identical to a U.S. D90 minus that barcode, that DOT barcode. Right. So I use that as my tool in a round car when I go to Dubai. Oh. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> Air conditioning, hey, everything. Yeah. Automatic. So what's the what's the future hold? So you're going to bring the 150 here, and then are you going to take it around to car shows? Do you do you get out yeah. to Land Rover well, events? Well, I, I don't get the Land Rover events because one, I am busy as hell. I want to get out to you know the Expo Expedition, you know Portals Expo, or you know out in Arizona one of these days i think we're going to probably trick out the 150 okay. uh just like i did to uh the bad wolf which like i said it was at it was at trevor's for a year and we put a new roll cage on it with like, that whole patriot performance roll cage we put on you know i had a south african roof rack and you know gave it a two inch lift repaired everything you know that that could go wrong that does go wrong on the car which is everything mm-hmm. And uh, as a matter of fact, modified it. It has a very interesting modification in the interior. Someone on Defender Source about four or five years ago was selling a cubby box system that would was front and back. Hmm. And it appeared very custom built. And I know it had to have come from Land Rover Special Vehicles. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a seam on this thing. It was all bended metal. And it was pristine. And it looked like a front box. You know, only, you know, a solid front box. Then there was a middle box between two seats, not a bench that sat on the floor and then stepped up to a third box that sat between two seats. And someone sold that on Defender Source. I bought that. I was like, boom, you know, and uh, I got that thing. And so I had that system installed uh, in Bad Wolf and the Bad Wolf only seats four. And we took the front seats, uh, the front bucket seats, which were all leather, this 1984 leather, and we we built frames in the back for individual seats. So there are two individual seats in the back, and then there are two brand new Puma seats on the front with seat warmers. Ooh, look, at you, look at you. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yes. This there winter, you. it was minus 20 degrees in upstate New York mm-hmm. for two weeks. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And and mm-hmm. I also put in a Webasto heating system in there and pimped out the stereo and shitloads of carling. I don't know. I can say that on here. It's a podcast. That's fine. So uh, that is my car. That is my dream car. Nice. And uh, then we thought, maybe we could do that to the 150. <laughs> <You know? laughs> put on that, you know, we just pimp it out, put a Puma hood on it, make people jealous. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. I, once it gets to the United States, I think that one's going going to probably be converted into a diesel. Uh, you know, if I get right 300 TDI. But, right. you know, East, yeah. if, I'm sure you guys read Land Rover Monthly. Um, mm-hmm. My the, the best part about my job is I go through England a lot. Mm-hmm. So I can pick up a Land Rover Owner, Land Rover Monthly, the new series magazine, Classics magazine. And you see these cars that, you know, get all pimped out. And they they lose the flavor 
of what a 110, of what a real Defender is. I don't like these super mod cars. Yep, I'm with but, you. Know, I don't I had, either. Yeah, but I was, I had Foley's. I went to Foley's, and they were just like, bring Big Bird here. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I would have to, because in the UAE, to get a car out, it must be fully operational. It has to pass inspection, and their system is the Swiss our country system, right? Oh, dear. Um, no, it's ruthless. So oh. your car must be, you know. They have car, no sense of humor. <clears throat> no. And um, so everything must match perfectly. It must roll out, and then it must be able to drive off a, a flatbed mm -hmm. and then drive onto a row row or mm -hmm. into a container. It cannot be pushed into a container. Mm. It cannot be pushed onto a row row. Mm. It has to be fully operational at the time that it boards a ship. Hmm. And I, I can actually, I've had all my cars on, on row rows. Oh, yeah. And had them here in less than 90 days. And they drive right off in, in Dundalk. Mm -hmm. And that's where the trouble starts, right? Mm -hmm. That's when they put on the hazards and they leave them on all winter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you uh -huh. can't get your car for like a month. Mm -hmm. And there's no battery, mm -hmm. you know, everything's turned to sludge. Yep. So all my troubles start, start when it gets to Baltimore. <laughs> so they're coming back to the United States. And my, my, my 110 hardtop, we're seriously thinking about if, you know, doing it a, on a, what, what, you know, a um, trans America's travel, but it'll have to be like two weeks at a time. The most time that I can get off is about, right. you know, 10 10 days and then I'd have to go to a capital city somewhere each where where if there's television or use a big end satellite and do it like my combat, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> do it like clandestine reporting out in the right. field using a satellite link. Okay. Why, don't, why don't we build you a truck with a satellite uplink in it? Oh, that would be awesome. Who can do that? Well, <laughs> give me a call. That. We'll figure it out. Oh, well, you know, I'm telling you, Defender 150, baby. I, that, <laughs> yeah, was and about that. I was I was going to say that 150, yeah, the satellite uplink. And if you want to go diesel, I think that one might deserve a Cummins. I think, uh, you know what? It's funny you should talk about it. There, there's a great guy out in Long Island, uh, runs a place called Rover Tech. I'm sure he has to change his name now, right? Oh, uh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> You're not allowed to say Rover. If he, if he hasn't already. If he hasn't already. And he had, uh, I think it was a, Cummins engine in there that was from a Humvee. Uh, and he and he was just like, I just need a car to install this thing in. And I was looking at it like this could be the one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think so too. I think that when when you know when Big Bird gets to the States, it'll probably change colors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um <laughs> we should know. uh no, no, yellow, no, yellow is yellow's pretty cool, hard to lose in a parking lot. No, I couldn't have it. No. no. All right. Well, no. Well, I mean, we tricked it out like Simba. You know, we had it all black. We actually did photo mods of it as, a, you know, in all black and all that stuff and lifted with roll, you know, with a winch and all that stuff on it. And uh, I've already got, you know, the funny thing about living overseas is I get so much more gear than it's a lot easier. He's much easier to get South African stuff over there. Oh, yeah. So, um, and now I can get ARB bumpers. I, and I bought three ARB bumpers. So I, I bought two back here and I, you know, I put one on one of my cars and I got one sitting out there waiting for, you know, for the big bird to come back, you know, you know, all sorts of, you know, uh, a re, you know, front runner. I have the, you know, the pop-up wing side windows, which are hard to get and hmm. things like that. So cool. when, uh, when the bird comes back, yeah, she's probably going to be turned into around the world, but, my 110 hardtop is probably going to take me down to Valparaiso, you know, down there, so I can jump on a boat to Antarctica or something. Well, wait a minute. Now you're, now you're talking because you you would then be the second <coughs> guest we've had on the show that's been to Antarctica. Oh, well, I'm going there anyway. No. <laughs> well, and when, when you get true. there, we want to have you on the show because we need we need a link. That's true. From Antarctica to our show. That's well, that'd be cool. That would and be we'll cool. give you stickers because we're going to uh -oh. do a broadcast from the seventh continent. We need that. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna have to get me some of those stickers. Absolutely, and, yeah, I'll uh, send you some. Put them on my truck. But you know, so long as we have, how much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> as much as you have, as much as you oh, want, okay. <laughs> until mean, you well, stop breathing. Let, let me ask. I'll tell you a couple of things that are very interesting. My big thing in the since I came back to the United States is one of my my pet peeves 
There is a very big difference between rover owners in the United States and, and the ones around the rest of the world okay. to a certain extent. And I'll try to be politically correct about this. Oh, <laughs> so that's a great off, tradition. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of defender owners, you know, and series owners who, who know nothing about those cars. Mm-hmm. And look, I'm not a rivet counter. I'm a user. And let me tell you something. Let me tell you the rovers I've driven in. Okay, I've driven an RSOF, right, a Ranger Special Operations vehicle, mm. 110. I've driven an armored. I've driven an armored TV version vehicle. I've driven an armored ambulance mm. okay. <laughs> version. You know, 110. Uh, you know, ambulance or in 110. Pff, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what the wheelbase is on that. Uh, you know, armored ambulance version. I've driven high cap pickup. Uh, 130 with a 105 millimeter recoilless rifle next. <laughs> uh, I've driven one a one a 130 pickup with a twin 23 millimeter anti aircraft gun Whoa. in the back in wow. in combat. Wow! <laughs> right. Okay. Well, let me say near combat. I was an advisor, <laughs> um, and you know um, I've seen some of the, the the spookiest rover I've seen is 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 made out of unobtainium, which is one that was um, I saw the SP, this British uh, Special Boat Service in the SBS. Oh, and uh, it was a it was a 130, and it had all sorts of spooky ass features. And you know, it's it's unobtainium. <laughs> it's yep. just, you know, I've seen uh, you know, I mean, the WMIKs. You know, I've driven those around, and then you know the. The hoopty cut tops with machine guns adorned all over. But the coolest one I've ever seen, though, I'll tell you the coolest rover I've seen in the world. When I was in Libya, in Benghazi, there was a Defender 110 hardtop. Libya is a land, a, a secret fantasy land filled with all sorts of series and Defender trucks everywhere. Everywhere. Just, you know, it was when the government collapsed, everybody just went and grabbed them. And the first time I flew in there, or first time I drove in there, um, first thing I saw was an 88-inch Series 3. Like, boom, in Libya. Hey, there's a Series Here we are. Yeah, there <laughs> right you go. there. And then he went around the roundabout. Then around the roundabout was another one. And every tow truck in Libya is a Series 3 109 tow truck. Nice. Right on. Yeah, yellow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bright yellow with orange. You know, edges. They they it's, double A rejects. Ugly. No, they the Brits built them as a as a uh, a custom order for the government of Libya. No. It's like they painted and, them double A yellow though. Yeah, yeah. well, huh. I, don't know. I don't know why, but they uh, they wanted them that way, nostalgic probably. But this guy had this all jet black one ten hard top lifted up. It was all tricked out and. Three times when I was in Benghazi, I had my like my I didn't have my weapons at the ready. I had my camera at the ready. <laughs> I was like, that black that black one ten is gonna come by here, and it had the Libyan flag painted completely across the body, right? So that wow. the crescent moon and the star was on one side, each side of the truck, yeah. and then it had a, like a big twenty five foot Libyan flag on a steel pole off the back of this truck, wow. cruising around, showing Libya. And I was just like, first time I saw it, I was so freaked out. I didn't even realize. I was like, that is freaky. That guy's got his truck painted up as a gigantic Libyan flag. And then I was just like, hey, that's a hard top. <laughs> you know? And I camera up, gone. Yep. Yep. The second wow. time I saw it was in the middle of the night. And that's not the kind of place uh, at that time that you would just be playing around. So I, you know, I was like, turn around, turn around. <laughs> we couldn't turn around. I was going to chase his ass down, right? Find out who he was and see if the truck was for sale. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Find out what year it is, right? And wow. then the third time I saw this guy, I was at, um, I was at a hotel, and I was on a balcony, and sure as shit, you know, there's the flag, that giant, huge <laughs> waving flag behind the truck, off on the highway. I was like. Uh-huh. I am never going to see that truck. And then I spoke to some people I knew in the Rover community. They're like, that truck's famous. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, it is. Yep. That truck, if it's a 91, <laughs> that thing's coming back. 
they don't even have an import export routine, right? They just throw people onto a boat and they all drown. <laughs> Right. So it's very hard to get anything exported out of Libya. Right. Can't right. even drive it to Egypt. So what's wow. so what is the difference then? So you're saying the I guess the North American American uh, uh, you know, Land Rover folks don't understand all that special yeah. history. Is that what is that your some kind of things? Get after? I, my first pet peeve is that most Americans who a lot of Americans who have defenders, whether they're D90s or 110s. They're not rivet counters either, and I think they're more, you know, showboaters. Mm -hmm. They just don't know jack about their <laughs> their car. I photographed uh, the other last year. I went across the United States on a, a security assessment, and I went to like twenty major cities, and I photographed every Defender or series that I saw on that trip, and stopped everybody that I could stop. And some of them are really reliable, like in Venice Beach, California. There is a uh, there's a series three one oh nine. Uh, what do you call the pop top? Uh, Dormobile. Dormobile. Yeah. Oh, Dormobile. Yeah. And that thing is awesome. Mm -hmm. And it's always out in front of this guy's house. And you can see he moves it around and it's really in good condition. So every time I'm in Venice, it's like <laughs> I'm just seeing the Dormobiles out there. Yeah. Sure enough, it is. Yep. I was just in Del Mar, California this weekend. And there's a couple who live there right off the beach and they have a beautiful home. And they had a blue 97 uh, D90, and they knew nothing about it. All they knew is that they only drove it in, uh, in, in summer, and they kept it in winter in close cover. And I was just like, what's its name? <laughs> they were like, what do you mean, what's its name? It was just even my wife was like having a heart attack, like, oh, uh, wait a minute. Yep. Okay, there's some rules if you're going to be allowed to own that car, right? <laughs> yeah. um, we're like um, you more. We're, we like you more and more now because this. You, oh you, yeah. You fit into well, I thinking. mean, the Brits. The Brits hammered that in my head. I did a BBC documentary um, two years ago on waterboarding. Um, oh, this is a good story. Uh, <laughs> and I, well, we we were, we were actually in this small town. Uh, called Dorking, <laughs> which is where we were, our hotel was. But our, you know, as we we're driving down, they were like, oh, we're going to be at the uh, studio where they did Top Gear. Oh. And Top Gear is was just canceled. So this giant space was open. The Toyota was still inside. You know, the nice. seating was yeah. all still there. And we were in the next hangar. And we were at this aerodrome. And I said... So I said to the guy there, this guy comes driving up and he's got a, his own little, you know, an older 110. And I go, oh, that's a nice 110. And we start talking. I go, you know what I'd like to know? And he goes, what? I go, I'd like to know where's the Dunsfold collection at? Where the hell's Dunsfold? He goes, this is Dunsfold Aerodrome. <laughs> the collection's right there in those buildings. <laughs> on the other side. No kidding. And I was like, you are absolutely kidding me, right? And I'm like, I go forget this documentary. Yeah. So <laughs> bye, see ya. Yeah, bye, y'all. So of course he's looking at me like I'm crazy because you know here's this black guy who's here, you know, dressed up to waterboard people, <laughs> and, and I'm looking for the Dunsfold collection. He's just like, you know about the Dunsfold collection? I'm like, dude, yeah. who doesn't know about the freaking Dunsfold collection? That thing's still got gigantic holes in it. And so he goes, oh, okay. He goes, well, let's, you know, he says, but it's run by Dunfold Jaguar Land Rover. And the collection had, they had just had, they have one or two days per year where the collection is brought out. I think they had had it like the month before. And so I was just like, before I leave this country, you were getting me into that freaking hangar. <laughs> you were getting me into that, that place. <laughs> and so... Unfortunately, the guy who managed the collection at that time had just left the country. Uh, but I've got a rain check. And they were like, oh, just tell us you're that guy. I was there with BBC. And I'm like, I am pulling that card yeah. <laughs> next time I'm in England. You couldn't break going in. Down there. You have skills. I got I break in. Why would I do that? I had <laughs> lights on and everything. I tell you, I start driving stuff out. But what I liked about England was, I mean, first off, you got defenders everywhere. We right. counted in the one week we were there, we counted every defender we saw between Dorking and Dunsfold. <laughs> Just between Dorking and Dunsfold, uh, 94. Yeah. 
and yep. Yep. and uh, and I don't know if you know about England, but yep. the the my middle name for a week with my my GPS was <coughs> at the roundabout. At the roundabout, <laughs> take take exit three. Yeah. Because England is nothing but a bunch of roundabouts uh, yeah, uh, right. with like a yep. hundred yards in between each mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. And every time I'd see one, we'd all be at the roundabout, like twirling away from each other. So there was no getting the camera out. But we met all sorts of great guys there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And this year I'm trying to get to Petersboro. And um, I, if I can get some time off, needless to say, because I, I belong to the spy museum, I have to go up to uh, Betchley Park, which is. Oh, that's cool. Uh, the old Code uh, Breakers yep. place up there, which is my career field. I yep, I was there uh, back in about th- three or four years ago when it, it oh, right after it awesome. opened up. It's it is really it is really cool. It's a it's a mm-hmm. an amazing. You know what's place horrible? I am a member of Bracely Park, and I have a stone there <laughs> with my name on it. Really? And and had to get up there. So oh. <laughs> really need to work on that, but. Yeah. Yeah. Also, when when I was there, one of the fun things is, is you'd see all sorts of weird stuff. And it turns out that it was, I think it was Armed Forces Day. And we had driven the Portsmouth because my son's a maritime archaeologist. And he couldn't make it. And he was like, you guys need to go visit the Mary Rose. I need pictures. You know, this old ship. I, I need pictures for my doctorate, my master's thesis. We visited HMS Victory and all that stuff. And as we were leaving, we were just pulling out of the front gate, uh, a WMIK. 110 mm. pulls up next to us with all the guys with their <laughs> kit and the machine guns and everything on it. And, it. and this was this was armed forces vehicle. And they had a flag, you know, the big help for heroes flag yeah. on back. And they were driving up to a town that was near Dorking to start off armed forces day. And so <laughs> needless to say, I jumped out. I was like, what are you guys going with this car? And why are you not putting it on that ship from my house? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so we got a big laugh. And they were like, well, we're going up near, near Dorking. We're going up to, I can't remember the name of the town. But and it, we, I said, I'll just follow you for fun. And so they had to drive, you know, like 50 miles per hour with their flag, because that's all their flag could take. And then from there, they were going to lead a giant procession for Help for Heroes, which is their version of the Wounded Warrior, right. up into London to Buckingham Palace. Uh, <laughs> and I was just like, if I stay right behind you, and they were like, no, you're not even in a land room. <laughs> I we were in some British car, I can't remember. Vauxhall. Yeah. Uh, it was a Vauxhall, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think about it, a new yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. Totally automatic. Yeah. Yeah, of course yeah. it was. So, a, che- a Chevrolet with a fancy name. Yeah. Actually, I think so Foxhall's gone. Questions? You're no. talking armored stuff that you've seen. Did you did yeah. you see the the Shoreland that sold on uh, Bringer Taylor the other day? Oh yeah, somebody somebody cued me in. Was that you who sent me to go look at that? No, it that wasn't, wasn't expensive either. No, I, I don't think so it's. Forth. I don't think like it 7, met reserve. I think uh, it only went to fourteen. I don't think it met reserve. That's right. Yeah, but you know, it was a, it was a night, nice nice. It was a nice looking Shortland, though. I've Got to say. Now, if you had one of them Shortland Defender riot vehicles, yeah, now you'd be talking. I saw one right. of those. We were horseback riding in um, in because uh, my family's very horsey. We were horseback, and I I am a new old rider, right? And and most people think, well, black guys can't ride horses. Turns out, <laughs> my great grand uncle was a teamster in World War One. Oh, <laughs> and that's cool. You know. Yeah. He and my grandfather, who both fought in France in World War I, drove teams of nice. horses out to the battlefield. You know, bombs out, bodies back, right? Yeah. And so and I, I, my whole life, I was like, oh, I want to ride a horse. Why do I want to ride a horse? And so we went to Northern Ireland. We, were, we had a, uh, a two-week riding vacation. And while I was there, we, there's one part. You know, they took down all the border mm-hmm. stuff for Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. There's no difference right. now. Right. And we went through Northern Ireland a couple of miles. And I was just like, oh, this is very pleasant. And then I saw a Royal Ulster Constabulary, yep. you know, armored Shortland, mm. you know, 110 and full riot kit. Mm. And I'm like, I think we're on the Northern Ireland side of this trip. Yep. Yes, you are. Because on the South, they were driving Toyotas. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's how you tell. Yep. Oh, yeah. I was in, uh, I was in, uh, all, yeah, all through good parts of uh, northern ireland shortly after they had taken all the 
all the border stuff down. And I remember seeing the, those Land Rovers that were in their full riot gear. That was uh, oh, yeah. intimidating. You know you're in Northern Ireland when you see armor-plated Land Rovers. You know, but they were sort of nostalgic. It's all over. The troubles are finished over there. Right, so, right. You know, and, uh, you know, they're still finding stuff. Oh, absolutely, um, yeah. But that was fun. We were in Norway a couple of months ago, and there, while we were there, we saw a British group of Royal Marines in Defenders. Oh. Didn't see a one in Norwegian kit. But they're, you know, they're just a fascinating vehicle, and yeah. they're everywhere. When I was in Afghanistan, you know, uh, like the Czechs, the Poles, uh, several special forces units have their own versions of it. And I think the most interesting one that I've seen is a modification of a Defender 130, where they redid the entire exterior, and it was called the um, the Jackal. And it, we saw it in in uh, Jordan. And when I was in operating in uh, Iraq, uh, I was private security contracting uh, for the U.S. government, and we had to get Desert Patrol vehicles. And um, yeah, and I took a look at this thing, and they modified the whole front end, but it could it could seat six heavy machine gun mounts and everything. And I was just like, man, yeah, this thing really looks, you know, it looks like somebody took a 110 and took off all the 110 features mm -hmm. on the front and just, you know, up modded this vehicle to look sort of like a Toyota 79 front end, right? <laughs> but it was, it's all based on a, it's all based on a 130. Mm -hmm. Africa, there's every beater you can imagine is down there. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's just a fascinating world. But getting back to that last point about what are some of the other things about 110 def one, or Defender owners. Uh, first is they don't wave. Don't see a lot of waving here. People will actually no. literally see me and like look at me. Nope, and don't. it's like, dude, we have the only two Defenders in 500 miles. Yep. yep. Right? You might want to wave. I mean, look, the Brits got stickers for that. Yes, they right? do. Yes, they do. And when I, you know, and of course, the UAE Land Rovers Club is completely international. Mm -hmm. We had a French pilot who flew for the Royal Flight and flew 747s who had his 110 completely up modded and new engined in San Francisco and flew it over to the UAE. <laughs> Right uh, was tricked out. The only thing that thing was missing was like smoke launchers, but that was his <laughs> private ride. And uh, we had a lot of Lebanese guys, a lot of Iranians. The Iranians love yeah. uh, the defenders. Yeah. Um, and my, my Minerva, the silver uh, TD five sold to a guy um, who shipped it right to the Philippines where it was uh, substantially cheaper. And he, he sent it there for his dad because they were about there. They had a huge monsoon season. And he wanted his dad to be in it. You know, he had the, the bottom side completely um, redone, holes filled, everything so that it could, you know, ford water. Hmm. It was really, uh, you know, that guy really put it to it. Yeah. So, you know, it's a great world out there. And these things are everywhere. Um, mm -hmm. I have been someplace that, that a lot of people haven't been to besides Papua New Guinea. All right. <laughs> Papua New Guinea, that's an that's a ace of the whole card. That is. Where, you know, but uh, I went to Bhutan which is east of Nepal. Right, right. And uh, when we were in Bhutan, the UN were the only people who were operating uh, 110s there, as far as I could tell. Yeah. Even the Bhutanese army had shifted over to land cruiser. So we went over and we like, who's 110s that out front? <laughs> right. So we went tooling around a, yeah. downtown Timpu, Bhutan, and in a 110. Nice. Uh, but unlike Sam Watson, I don't get paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I haven't. We haven't had Sam on the show yet, although he is a he's a, a big supporter of the show and has been listening since the very beginning. Let's we'll get him on the show. Maybe now now that you're on the show, maybe he'll come want to come on. Oh, and I'll talk. get him on. Yeah, there he'll come go. on. Yeah. Talk, talk <laughs> he's about awesome, man. I mean, he's got real adventures. I just you know, like I said, I'm a user. That guy yeah. knows stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so what's the most tricked out one that that you want? that you you don't have in your collection is there something that uh, you you'd highly desire that uh, that that you you like to get your hands on Anything well there is to mind? <laughs> well like i said there is a the the, the special boat service the sbs so, version huh yeah they have a 130 that like i said i've asked people in the know and uh, I've only known one guy who was at Special Vehicles who's like, yo. And he, he, all he would do is look at me and he goes, and he goes, what are you talking about? And I'd go, white 130, flip 
tops. And he's just like, boat service. Well, what else you want to talk about? <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's just like, yeah, I know it's the boat service. I talked to them. <laughs> Where mm-hmm. is the truck at? When is it getting demobilized? <laughs> you know? Yep. How do I get a minigun pop-up? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, um, that might be a show title. It's, it, it's famous. It actually was at, uh, Rob Pelton probably knows about it, um, because it was at the, um, at the, at the prison riot, oh, um, okay. um, which is yeah. the only place you'll see a photograph of it. Um, some news crew was filming at the riot walls, and over in the right-hand side was two of these trucks. <laughs> and, you know, and nobody really identified it till years later when I was talking to this REME guy, this REME guy from UAE Special Forces. And he was just like, well, you know, it's like the boat services. And I'm like, what What boat service? And he showed me pictures. And he goes, well, you know about these, right? And I go, I've seen that freaking truck. <laughs> you know? It's a white 130 with hard top sides. And he's just like, no, it ain't. <laughs> it's all sorts of cool in there. But that's the only one. I mean, I've seen... You know, I've seen weird, weird stuff and Africa mods. You know, one of the best places I've ever seen. Have you guys, any of you been to Nairobi, been to Kenya? No, I have not. Nope. Oh, my God. Really? <gasps> Schumacher. Mm-hmm. Schumacher 4x4 in Nairobi. Okay. You guys have to go there. I mean, there are some places around the world that really do stuff, you know. Um, uh, you know, but Schumacher... Four by four. You can look them up on online. Just Schumacher Land Rover Nairobi. These guys make these jungle vehicles, these f- high end expedition vehicles mm. that are just awesome looking. They literally have like a uh, wildebeest catcher on the front. Oh, okay. They're prongs on these custom made bush bars, bull bars Is that, that the- are designed to catch the animal once you've knocked the legs out so like if you go oh, through yeah. a flock of gazelle uh-huh. right they're designed to catch them and lift them off the feet right because oh. if, if if otherwise they're going into your windshield right yeah and right. uh the, right. and really but they're custom made there the roll cages are all custom made there they put on these side barrier roll cages if i could find somebody who can build me a roll cage like that that's what Big Bird would be going to. It would be going get, to a Schumacher build. Get me a picture. Build. Get me a oh, picture. Easy. I can I've do got, it. I've got about a dozen Schumacher yeah. build pictures Br- in my room. Bring, me, photo bring me pictures in your truck and I can make it happen. <laughs> oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This thing has got it. It's got side impact it. protection. Oh, yeah. And Dude, anything, anything you can bring up, I can make happen for you. <laughs> okay. He, he, i got a roll cage that's got to go on the gopher. So, All right. Uh, so call we'll, me. We'll, we'll talk about that. Call, call me. So, but that's about it. I mean, you know, it's a it's a wild world out there, and yeah. you just got to keep reading Land Rover Monthly. We're all going to get rich, by the way. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah, of course we new, are. New Defender's coming. So, okay, that, that, maybe that's a good exit exit uh, topic. Mm-hmm. What do you think of the, what should the new Defender be? What would it mean? What's it mean to you? And, uh, you know. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, new Defender is designed... From everything that I've read, uh, and you know, I, I'm not privy to the Jaguar Land Rover spec, although I just saw those those secret photos of it on a disco body, right? Yeah. Uh, but they wanted to compete with the Jeep Grand Cherokee, right? And the only way it's going to do that, look, my truck has 12 now 15 fuses, only because I put one of those <laughs> awesome ass GMB double double battery systems in there by the way have you guys ever bought stuff in germany and france there's some awesome places over there oh, yeah. nakatanaga and uh gmb and there's one in my ex-girlfriend's village has a place there in buell oh. uh called uh, it's not a kip four by four yeah it's a kip four by four and they make all the suspension for german army defenders uh, german special forces defenders It's like a $10,000 suspension system, air suspension, all that stuff. But, Mm -hmm. um, but, um, the new 110, it can't be that. I mean, it just can't be what it's probably going to be is a discovery, uh, wheelbase. And it's going to have a boatload of fuses and fuse. I've seen, I've seen that coming. And it's a natural, you know, you're not going to make, it's, it's not going to be, I just jump started my truck the other day. Right. Mm -hmm. 
battery ran flat over the winter. Mm -hmm. And uh, four miles per hour, the truck starts. Yep. Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't think this truck is going to be able to do that. I can, I can bump start my meat wagon in 10 feet if I have to. Yeah. Been there, so, done that. You know, it, and I don't think it's going to, they say that they're going to keep the boxy ish design. Yeah, well, and, and yeah, I, well. that last article I read from a couple of weeks ago, they were like, we're going to give the G Wagon a run for their money. What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. This is not, you want a G Wagon? Go get an icon. Yeah. Right. If you right. want to go up against the G Wagon, go out and get one of those, you know, Super mm -hmm. tricked out, pimped out, you know, 500 horsepower, oh, yeah. you know, Defender 90s. Uh, but I specifically. Or look, just you, buy a G Wagon and be done with it. Oh, yeah. If you that's know, what you want. My goal, in li my goal in life is achieved all the time. G Wagon owners look at me. <laughs> okay. yeah. so and they go. go yeah. Look at that bad boy. Yeah. Oh, he oh, goes, yeah. oh, Defender, look. He's got a, he's got a, giant south african tent on his roof rack and yeah he looks good mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there you go so, mm -hmm. so there you go that's right well the, the the new defender it it's got to compete in america it's got to compete <laughs> in china it's got to compete around the world so there's no way they a they can't build it like they used like they did because it's all hand built so you got to use modern modern building methods it's got to be more reliable than they were in the past and you know, so it's got to it'd be all yeah. those things and they didn't have the time we've talked about this in the show a number of times they, they, you know, Land Rover didn't have the money or the, to invest in a in the series Defender line to keep it current throughout the six seventy years. Uh, they didn't have the money for it, and now, then when they did, you know, then then all, now you have the new Land Rover coming out, and that's what the new yeah. Defender is going to now finally be moved into the current world. It's going to be look. We already know it's a Discovery Four. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, so, how else can they afford yeah, to build it? I'm sure it's off. It's, I'm sure it's off-road capability is going to be awesome because it's all electronic. Yes, right? absolutely. You can read the road, right? right? Well, sure. The, I, the discos for, and Range Rovers are great off-road too, but they're not Defenders. Yes. Yeah, I know. And it, it, you know, I can read the road. I can read the road myself. Mm -hmm. You know, if 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 it, I just would not have had the exact same adventure if I'd gone to that giant bowl in Lewa in what is essentially a narrow Toyota FJ. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Yeah. I mean, my uh, granted I, I could have a, a, an automatic, you know, I could all I could have an automatic car and and do that, but it just it, it won't even have the pedigree. It'll have the pedigree of a Range Rover and an LR3. Yep. And I have an LR3. I love the hell out of my LR3. Yep. You know. And where's uh, the fun dishwasher? Where's the fun in turning your car to sand mode? That's that's, oh. that's effectively what we're talking about. You know, is, is you're going to move the move the dial to sand mode and then go into the, <laughs> into the sand bowl, right? You know, I see FJs with sand ladders and mm -hmm. roof racks, and I go, "Yeah, that's an awesome looking car to go to CrossFit in." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I got some news for you, bros. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're and there's some awesome rock crawling out there, and there's people out there doing their thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to respect that. But we are of a different kind. I mean, I mean, how, everybody has a copy of the, you know, the ex vehicle based expedition guide, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> so, mm -hmm, absolutely. And I, when I think about driving my 110, or you know, when I get Doug here, I am not joking. Two weeks at a pop, as yep. far as I can go, down to Valparaiso over a year or so. Yeah. Um, because that, and everybody will know what I'm in, and it's not because that car is iconic. It's because, as I said in Top Gear, the most unreliable car in the world is the most reliable car in the world. Yep, there you go. It'll get well, me where I got to go. At least in Bolivia it is. <laughs> oh, it is? So wait, you've been to Bolivia? No, that Bolivia. was the Bolivian special where they said that. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, he was driving a Series 2, right? No, nah, it was a Range Rover. Oh, was it a Range Rover? It, no, was, a, it was a... I'm talking about yeah. the original one where he's driving a Series 2. He starts the the segment with the series two. Oh, that's and he talks. It, it's about the defender in the series. That's yeah, the, that's 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 Hammond with a, that's uh, actually yeah. a series one in in that. Is he? Yeah, what I'm talking about was the Bolivian special where they they picked their vehicles and they went across Bolivia and Clarkson was in a Range Rover and he won yeah. it and he said the least reliable vehicle in the world is the most reliable. <laughs> was it in like an old Range Rover like a P two or 
it was it was no, it was a classic with with the three point nine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wow. Well, there you go. And you, Mal- well, well, yeah, Malcolm, you're thinking you- of the most important car. They did a series on the most important cars in the world, and that was uh-huh. Hammond Series One, his his personal vehicle. And oh that, yeah. And that's when he says the that's when he says the line that we have to repeat in every episode where. You know, it's uh, doing important things for important people because that, yes. that was the line that came from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I love it. And, uh, you know, my blood doesn't run green. You know, it runs tan. Most of my vehicles are <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> military. You spend tan, enough time in the desert. But, right? Yeah. You know, but, uh, you know, these, this is this is that is my car. And my wife has the LR3. <laughs> so, uh, OK. You know, okay. yeah. Uh, and. Yeah. And I drive it around, and I, I get insane offers for my cars too. Mainly people who want to go out to the, you know, to the Hamptons or to Nantucket, which I am now authorized to go on to Nantucket because I own a 110. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> Everybody yeah. else has one, right? <laughs> so, nice. uh, With it, maybe you'd be the only non-poser 110 driver, though. Well, yeah, you know, true. well. It depends. You got to ask them if their car's got a name. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, but you know, even posers, it's fun to educate the hell out of them. Oh, Especially absolutely. when you go, yeah, I fired a 105 millimeter recoilless rifle off of my <laughs> my 130, you know, high cap pickup once. That, that but, is a hell of a way to knock on the door. <laughs> it is. Well, you have All the right. distinction, I think, of being the our only guest who has ever, in fact fired him a, a machine gun off the back of a land. No, I'm sure there's a, I'm sure there's other guys. There's a lot of special ops guys. You'll find a ranger who will run True. around. One of these days, I am on the hunt for an Arstoff. Uh that's mm. that's the one car that if I could have in my collection, I'd I'd even trade a 150 for. Wow. But there's only two or three of them that were demobilized. The Rangers, oh my god, they used the heck out of them in Afghanistan. I mean, they were just trash. Oh, beat, yeah. Um, you know, huh probably going to give them to the afghans right but uh um, leave them in place so uh, i mean there was one burned out example that was i think a defense company bought it now brings it around to shows uh, but uh it was in recoil magazine i think gotcha, gotcha. so well so, malcolm yeah. <laughs> i think we we've had the whirlwind uh conversation and it's been wonderful i uh, thank you for coming on the show is there anything else you want to want to yeah. add in one last thing, guys, because, you know, we're all Rover, we're all Rover brothers here, you know, especially in the States. Guys, be cool. <laughs> OK, <laughs> if you see a Defender owner, he is already cool. <laughs> so, yes. you know, yes. just it, it's it's about the brotherhood. Yes. When I'm in England, I mean, these guys are like, oh, my God, you've got a Sandringham six or you've got a hard top and they. They know they know the rivet counters, you know, the guys who were just really into everything about the car. I cannot change my master cylinder, you know, even though I, I think I know how. Mm-hmm. One of these days I'll have to take a full mechanics course and, you know, you know, I can't read I can't figure out VINs off the top of my head. Right. But, you know, people who are out there who are in this lifestyle either gotta be educated or you should be cool with them. And yeah. There are a lot of guys out there who are very jealous of this in the States. <laughs> yeah. You don't own the brand. You own a truck. Mm-hmm. And if you see another rover, wave at them and uh, act like you're at Petersboro, which is just like the biggest group of drunks in the world, uh, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. There you go. So, I was at Petersburg. You know, we a couple all years love ago. each other, man. Yeah, it's a wonderful. You know? Yep. Yeah, I, I was at uh, Petersburg a couple of, uh, what, 2015, and uh, one of the listeners yeah. to the show offered to pick me up at the airport and drive me to Petersburg, and I got to sleep in the back of his 110. Mm. <laughs> oh. That's okay. also, no, also known as the lost episode of the Center Steer podcast. Uh, well, then, oh. yeah. we recorded <laughs> We recorded an episode in the B&B that I was staying at when, and back in the States with Harold and Morgan uh, in the States talking about the show. And I just somehow lost the file and it never got saved and we had to re-record it. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah there's, we have a lost episode. It didn't around long enough now. Yep. Wow. Yeah. That's salty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I hope this helps you guys. And, uh, oh, absolutely. you know, uh, uh, this, you know, just goes to show our love for Rovers. We all, we all bleed green and we all drink gin and tonics or <laughs> well, whatever it is. I'm more of a beer drinker, but yeah, I'm with you. I like my Me beer a little, a little warm, a little warm. 
It doesn't have and I'll, I'll leave you with I'll leave you with one more thought here. Um, you just mentioned wanting to learn the mechanics of this stuff. <coughs> Call me. Mm-hmm. I'll set well, you up. I'll- I'll tell you, my, my friend Gabor Antalix in, 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 in Philadelphia, he just got out of the business and, uh, because they, you know, sued him over his name. Uh, yeah. and, uh-huh. and I said, dude, Saturday mornings, eight to 12 defender maintenance classes. There you, there you go. Yeah. There you go. I said, dude, I throw money at that, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? But just give me safari maintenance. Mm-hmm. What you know, I've read everybody's overland experience. Uh, you know, all around the world, I read everybody's websites. I want to, you know, I, I'll probably try to do an Abu Dhabi to Cape Town to London. And the, you know, we got to know how to fix this damn thing, all right. right? My uh, my uh, uh, one last story. <laughs> my gas line on on Doug snapped. At seventy-five okay. miles per hour. Ooh. Okay. Right. And it was so just you, like so. You didn't stay at seventy-five very long after that. No, right? but you know, over there you've got Maseratis and Mercedes McLarens flying all around you. Oh yeah. And so pulling to the side of the road is an adventure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I thought as soon as I saw the cable, I was like, really? I'm pretty sure I could fix that. You know, mm-hmm. on the side of the road. But uh, I don't know. You guys will have to hook me and everybody else up. Think about it. Formal course. I think well, if you idea. if you want to come out for a weekend intensive, that that works too. You know, we can we can put together tailored training for you if you want. Got a car in Philly, baby. Needs a roll cage. There we go. Call right. me, man. It's not I'll that call you. All right. I will I will hook you up. All right. Well, thanks again, Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm is Malcolm Nance. You can find him on MSNBC. Uh, I think most nights it seems anymore, and also on the weekends. I've seen you on the weekends, and uh, you're a, uh, a thir- well. The official Twitter bio says U.S. intelligence plus thirty six years, expert terrorist. No, no, that doesn't sound right. Expert terror. <laughs> the, way, the, the way the line breaks, Malcolm. Expert terrorist break strategy tactics ideology torture Russian cyber exclamation point. There we go. And Navy, yeah. Ch- Navy, Sa- Navy senior chief and Jedi master. Mark Hamill actually knighted me as a Jedi master. <laughs> Done. Uh, good for you. Luke, Done. Luke, Luke Skywalker's my buddy. There you go. Well, there, uh, there, there is some street cred. Yeah, definitely. Well yeah, and gun owner. So when we get that Guns and Rovers podcast going, all right, we all can right. mix both things together. Beers, Guns and Rovers. Beers, Guns and Rovers. That, oh, there's a wonderful, wonderful combination. That, that's a heck of a mix. Yeah. All right. Guns, alcohol, and vehicles. You don't have to be driving them. No. <laughs> don't do them and all at, shooting s- at the same time. Yeah, not all at the same time. That's the that's the key there. Thanks. All right, you. guys. Well, thanks for having me on. Absolutely, Malcolm. Anytime yeah, you're always fun. welcome back. All right. Bye bye. And that's the show for June 2018. I want to thank uh, Harold and uh, Michael for coming on the show, as always, and helping us out. We w- will thank Morgan. You know, he wasn't able to join us. He was able to join us for part of the Malcolm interview, uh, but unfortunately, he was not available today. I think he's out camping. Is that what he's, he's you think he's camping? too busy doing important things somewhere with somebody. <laughs> And thanks to Malcolm Nance for joining us, coming on the show today and talking about Land Rovers. I Some great stories. I hope you enjoyed them. And if you are new to the podcast, thanks for sticking around to the very end. We really appreciate it. If you uh, enjoyed what you heard and you want to support us, go out to patreon.com slash center steer. And we'll have a link, of course, in the show notes to all of that. Our website is centersteer.com. That's in the British spelling, C-E-N-T-R-E. Dot com. So thanks thanks to Malcolm. Thanks for any maybe new listeners we have. And also thanks to the One True Packs for his production support, making us sound better every month. Well, at least audio-wise, maybe not by content. At least better than we could without him. And hopefully some of you will come out and, and meet all of us next month, or I guess depending on when the show drops on the airwaves later this month, uh, July 14th, British Car Day at the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix. You can get more information at pvgp.org. But uh, hopefully, if you're anywhere near Pittsburgh, you yeah, make the trip out and see us. It is worth the time. There's, it's not just the British cars that come out. It's really International Car Day. If you want to see German, you want to see American cars. There's a military, American military vehicles come out. Japanese cars. If you, every Triumph I think ever made, every MG ever made shows up too. I mean, I know that's part of the British Car Day, but they all show up. Well, it is hosted by the Western Pennsylvania Triumph Club, so you know they're going to have lots of Triumphs. But I 
wouldn't say everyone ever made, but it's certainly a good representative sample. Certainly feels like everyone ever made. Uh, there's a lot of there's a, a ton of Jaguars, uh, especially E types. Uh, you'll you'll see Aston Martins, you'll see Rolls Royce, you'll see Bentley, you'll see Rolls Royce Bentley. They all they all come out for the Vintage Grand Prix. In addition to the racing that goes on and you know, that you can that you can see at the same time. So it's a it's a it's a yes. good time and it's all free yes. by the way. The the Vintage Triumph guys are holding the annual Castner Cup Vintage Triumph races in coordination with Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix this year. So there's going to be even more vintage triumph race cars there this year whoa excellent don't forget we're having a wilkes toast giveaway so and thanks to alloy and grit for being part of that check out our website for details and go ahead and join in and to thank the wilkes brothers because without them none of this would happen <laughs> visit our website centersteer.com c-e-n-t-r-e-s-t-e-e-r and that's the British spelling to listen to previous shows and for show notes, which have links to stories discussed in today's show. Uh, we're part of the 4X4 radio network, the 4x4 radio network. And I invite you to check out the other 4x4 related shows at 4x4 radio network.com. You can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and email. You can directly support the show at patreon.com slash center steer. That's P A T R E O N, patreon.com slash center steer. If you're not a subscriber, please do. You'll get the show automatically. Automatically. Patreon subscribers get early access to updates from the Bells. So we're trying to get them back on schedule here. It's, I know it's been a while, but need to reconnect with the Bells and get them back in. I believe uh, the Bells are currently, I think, in Germany. So hopefully they have good internet con connectivity and uh, we can uh, join in with them. Uh, thanks for listening to show number 63. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're a new listener, give us a little shout out. If you, if you enjoyed it, if you didn't enjoy the show, that's okay. You don't have to give us a shout out. We're okay with that. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, though, and <laughs> what you're up to in your Land Rover. Until next time, I ask you to share the show with one other Land Rover enthusiast. Wave as we pass by. Oh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure if you were done or not.